Hello, and welcome to our online symposium, New Perspectives on Energy Innovation. My name is Eric Hint, and I'm a historian with the Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation, which is part of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History in Washington, DC. We're proud to be co-presenting today's program with our friends from Arizona State University's Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes, and two departments at Johns Hopkins University the Department of History of Science and Technology, and the Department of the History of Medicine. Again, welcome. We're glad you can join us today. Before I say a few words about today's program, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. You may be streaming this program directly from Eventbrite's webpage. However, however for the best viewing experience, we recommend using the Zoom application. Please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom control panel that runs across the bottom of your screen to post questions for our panelists. Questions will come to our moderator, uh, who will try to address as many of them as time permits. You can start posting those questions at any time. Please use the chat feature to share observations and engage in conversation with your fellow attendees. There's a drop-down box on the chat feature, and we encourage you to share your observations with everyone, not just the hosts and panelists. Please select the closed caption button if you'd like to view the live CART transcription of the webinar. And we thank everyone for adhering to the Smithsonian Code of Conduct by remaining civil and respectful with your comments and questions. Finally, we are recording these sessions. After some captioning and post-production, we will post the videos to the event website and the Lemelson Center's YouTube channel. Our overall theme today is new perspectives on energy innovation. The symposium marks the 50th anniversary of the oil embargo imposed by uh, the Arab countries of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting uh, Countries, OPEC, in the wake of the 1973 Arab-Israeli War. The temporary shortages, inflated energy prices, jolted the global economy, and destabilized geopolitical relationships around the world. The crisis also inspired new science and technology policies and several innovations, including alternative nuclear, solar, wind, and geothermal energy sources, and more fuel efficient automobiles. Today, we are again witnessing a resurgence in creative policy solutions and new energy innovations to address the ongoing challenges of war, energy scarcity, inflation, and the environmental impacts of climate change. In today's symposium, a distinguished group of historians, journalists, and government policymakers will discuss the lessons we can learn from the 1970s and how they might be applied to address our present day challenges and opportunities. Session one will take a historical look at 1973 and the decades that followed. After a short break, session two will highlight how today's emerging technology and policy innovations will shape our future approaches to energy and climate change. So now I'll invite our three panelists in session one to turn on their cameras just for a minute while I briefly introduce them and the themes uh, of our first session. Session one is titled Misremembering 1973, Crisis and Innovation. The session will grapple with the following questions. How do we remember? And how have we misunderstood the causes and reverberations of the 1970s energy crisis? How did the federal government, energy companies, and everyday citizens react? What kinds of energy policies and technological innovations emerged from the crisis? And which potential solutions proved to be unsustainable? What contemporary lessons can we learn from a more nuanced understanding of 1973 and its aftermath? And we're delighted to have three outstanding scholars who will help us better understand the 1973 energy crisis and the decades that followed. Our first speaker will be Meg Jacobs, a senior research scholar in the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Our second speaker will be Cyrus Modi, a professor of history of science, technology, and innovation at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. And our third speaker will be Richard F. Hirsch, a professor in the Department of History at Virginia Tech. In terms of format, um, we'll have each speaker give a short presentation, then the panel will engage in a few minutes of dialogue, and then we'll take up the audience's questions. So now, um, I will ask Cyrus and uh, Richard to mute their mics and cameras, and I'll do that in a second as well. And I'll invite Meg to share her slides uh, while I give her a full introduction. Again, Meg Jacobs is Senior Research Scholar in the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. 
Meg's first book, Pocketbook Politics, Economic Citizenship in 20th Century America, was published in 2004 and won the 2006 Ellis W. Hawley Prize, granted by the Organization of American Historians, and that's for the best book in modern political and economic history. Her second book, co-authored with Julian Zelizer, is Conservatives in Power, The Reagan Years, 1981 through 1989, published in 2010. And today, Meg will be sharing insights from her most recent book, Panic at the Pump, the energy crisis, and the transformation of American politics in the 1970s. Meg, we're delighted that you could join us today. And when you're ready, please take it away. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Uh, it's nice to be back at the Smithsonian, where I had a fellowship years ago when I was a graduate student. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, at some level, it's easy to describe the historical events that led to the energy crisis of the 1970s. The 50th anniversary that we are marking is when Arab producers of OPEC put in place an embargo on oil imports to the United States in October 1973 in response to American support of Israel against an attack from Egypt and Syria in the Yom Kippur War. The producers also threatened to cut back production by 25%. The idea that these oil sheiks were wielding the so-called oil weapon as a tool to influ influence American policy uh, was a novel idea. By December, the OPEC oil ministers had quadrupled the selling price of each barrel of their oil. Yet the question that I think is worth asking and considering is why Americans perceived this as a crisis, or as one policymaker put it, a, an energy Pearl Harbor. It's not inevitable that what in the end turned out to be a relatively minor disruption would trigger real fear and an actual crisis. So let me try to provide some context for why this was so alarming to Americans uh, and then reflect on some of the lessons that we've learned. So for starters, it's important to understand how dependent Americans had become on oil by 1973, which they relied on for almost about half of their energy needs. And at that moment in time, Oil was cheap, fill her up was a regular slogan, and prices at the pump uh, were about 30 cents a gallon. Cars were like living rooms on wheels, getting bigger and bigger every year. That development where we, as a society, drove everywhere in, uh, in our suburbs, in our cars alone, was not inevitable nor just the result of the United States sitting fortuitously on fossil rich soil. It was also the result of specific public policies that supported this suburban lifestyle. So we can think of, for example, the GI Bill of 1944 that enabled single family home ownership for millions of Americans and the National Highway and Defense Act of 1957, the largest public works program to date uh, that built a nationwide network of highways that reinforced the suburban living. So Americans by 1973 were very entrenched in their lifestyles, very used to their lifestyles. So the possibility that their lifestyle would have to change came as a real shock. Even more so, the public was not aware that the country actually imported any oil at all. By the late 1960s, demand, American demand was outpacing American supply. Even as the United States was the world's single largest producer, in 1970, the United States reached what it was believed to be its peak of production. And then between 1970 and 1973, the amount of imports doubled to about 36% of total oil consumption. So uh, that is what made the United States feel vulnerable in 1973. I'll share some images uh, with you. 
which will be nostalgic for some of you and maybe new information for others. This is a gas station in the 1950s. And the notable thing here uh, is exactly uh, how many service station attendants there are, uh, providing a real service, not just filling up your car. They even have little bow ties on. And the idea is that gasoline was so cheap that gas uh, stations competed on service, free windshield uh, cleaning and all of that, oil check, none of which happens today anymore. Here's an example of a 1970 Cadillac, uh, the living room on wheels. And here's a picture of, uh, of the highways uh, that came to really define the American landscape. So, that is what made Americans vulnerable in 1973. But then why the panic? I wrote a whole book, uh, as Eric re referred uh, to, uh, called Panic at the Pump. And it's worth thinking through what triggers a panic. Usually, it's when you don't have faith that things are going to work out. And the context here, of course, is a growing mistrust in the 1970s of government in part from Vietnam and in part from Watergate. The Saturday night massacre in which President Nixon, under investigation, fired the special prosecutor rather than release tapes that would ultimately lead to his re resignation, uh, that happened in October 1973. The larger context here is also important. What was so surprising about the energy crisis and why Americans were panicked, and this will come as perhaps the big, biggest change as compared to today, is that at the time, uh, in spite of Vietnam, in spite of Watergate, Americans still expected that their government was there to fix their problems, especially their economic problems. This was the generation that, elect, that had elected Franklin Roosevelt as president four times, first to end the Great Depression and then to fight World War II. And that kind of belief, faith in New Deal liberalism still prevailed. That was so much the case that when shortages first developed, even before the Arab embargo, a Democratic Congress passed a measure enabling the president to impose price controls to deal with the with inflation, a situation that's hard to fathom today. Richard Nixon, a conservative, but also an opportunist, surprised everyone when he announced that he would, in fact, put price controls in place. And these controls were still in place when the embargo happened. Americans, shocked as they were by the cutoff in supply, were also shocked by the rise in prices. And that is really when the panic set in, which made a minor disruption in service into a major inconvenience. If you are of a certain age, which I am, uh, you remember sitting in the back of your station wagon or perhaps driving your car and waiting hours and hours in gas lines. And these could even turn violent. The pollster Daniel Yanklovich told Richard Nixon, no issue has such a potential for producing social instability of the magnitude of the depression as does the energy crisis. The crisis entails a radical change. Their lives will be disrupted and altered at the gut level. Residents of a small rural vi village in Eastern North Carolina wrote to Nixon, people are spending every waking hour worrying over the gasoline situation. Even as the Watergate scandal was unfolding, polls reported that citizens cared far more about the energy shortage than they did about presidential wrongdoing. If Vietnam and Watergate taught Americans that they could not trust government, then the energy crisis taught them that government didn't work. And that was especially true when gas lines returned in the summer of 1979, when Americans experienced the second oil shock of the decade in the wake of the Iranian revolution. And even more so because the president at the time, 
Jimmy Carter had come into office promising to solve the energy crisis. There was so much anger at Carter that Carter Kiss My Gas became a popular bumper sticker. The California Energy Commissioner reported chaos. People have gotten into fights. Gasoline station attendants have been hit with pipes. If there was more order and less fear, we'd be able to get by, he said, but people are freaking out. The violence culminated in Levittown, Pennsylvania, where local residents staged a full-on riot, chanting more gas, more gas, outside of gas stations as they threw rocks, beer bottles, and cans at the local police and set two cars on fire. There is a panic at the pump, said a Miami service station owner. It is the worst it's ever been. I had to step between two people, said a New York station owner. After waiting online, they got into an argument right at the pumps about who was cutting in front. Three people lost their lives. And here I'll share some images with you of this moment. So here is the beginnings of the energy shortage. Sorry, no gas, a sign, um, a notification that Americans, uh, that came to Americans as a shock. Here's a picture of gas lines in 1973. Gas lines in 1979, you can tell that this is 79 because you can see that the price of gas is inching up towards a dollar, uh, which it had never been anywhere near before. And here's a picture of the gas riot in Levittown, Pennsylvania. When Jimmy Carter ran against Ronald Reagan in 1980, Reagan pointed to the energy crisis as exhibit A uh, of why Washington didn't work. Government is not the solution to your problems, he said in his inaugural address. Government is the problem. What's significant about the energy crisis is that it marked a turning, a turning point away from government, a turning point of growing mistrust and lack of faith in the confidence of government that had existed for a generation before. And we live with that mistrust today, of course. But the lesson of the energy crisis is that this is nothing new. Even as Nixon and Carter oversaw a system of price controls and allocations, they themselves were part of a shift away from government. Nixon was a conservative and in many ways, so too was Jimmy Carter as a small Southern businessman. So they did not fully believe in the measures they were overseeing, nor did they initiate any credible program of lasting alternative fuels. Carter famously installed solar panels on the White House roof in the summer of 1979, promising that the country would get 20% of its energy from renewables by the year 2000. But the political will for that kind of program was not there. Ronald Reagan famously then had the panels removed. And of course, behind all this is Americans' ongoing love affair with their cars. Our cars may be more few fuel efficient than they were in the 1970s, but we drive more miles and use more energy than we did then. And that is the dilemma that we face today. To solve the energy crisis of today, 50 years after that term first came into common usage, an energy crisis that is not just about high prices and limited supply, but one now, that now threatens our very planet, requires a collective effort led by our leaders. And for that to happen, Citizens have to once again trust that Washington can work. Thank you. Meg, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you for taking us back to 1973. Um, and thank you for conveying um, the real sense of instability, vulnerability, um, uncertainty, um, that really plagued the nation at that moment, uh, not just over the energy crisis, but over Watergate and Vietnam and everything else. So we really appreciate your talk. Uh, for our audience, I'll just uh, a reminder and invite you the the uh, 
the the uh, the Q and A uh, feature is open at any time. So if you want to start dropping a question now for Meg, that's fine. If you want to listen to a couple more talks, uh, that's also fine. But um, that's open to you at any moment, and uh, as well as the chat, if you want to put your your different observations uh, or to connect with other um, other attendees in the chat. So that's welcome to you, and we appreciate the engagement. So um, with that. Um, I will uh, invite Cyrus Modi to turn on his camera and his mic and to share his slides while I give him a full introduction. And you can see that it's evening uh, in the Netherlands, so we appreciate Cyrus being here at dinner time. Um, I've known Cyrus for a while, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Cyrus Modi. He is a professor uh, in the history of science tech of uh, of history, science, technology. The well, let me begin again. Cyrus Modi is professor in the history of science, technology, and innovation, and director of the Science, Technology, and Society Research Program at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. He is the author of three monographs published by MIT Press, including Instrumental Community, Probe Microscopy, and the Path to Nanotechnology, published in 2011, The Long Arm of Moore's Law, Microelectronics, and American Science, published 2016, and most recently, the Squares, U.S. Physical and Engineering Scientists in the Long 1970s, published in 2022. Cyrus is the principal investigator on a number of research grants, including a Dutch Research Council project called Managing Scarcity and Sustainability, the Oil Industry, Environmentalism, and Alternative Energy in the Age of Scarcity. And he'll be sharing some findings from that project today. Cyrus, we're delighted that you could join us today, and when you're ready, take it away. Thanks. Okay, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> many thanks uh, for the introduction, Eric, and uh, to the uh, organizers for the invitation to speak on a topic that is, uh, yeah, very closely related to my project, uh, Managing Scarcity and Sustainability. As Eric said, uh, that project is funded by the Dutch Research Council, but also uh, the Lemelson Center and CSPO are both among uh, our project uh, partner organizations. So, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to work with them uh, at this event today. <clears throat> and you can find out more information about uh, the project at the link under my name, uh, which will uh, take you to this uh, website. So I want to start with a game. Can you guess what year various energy crises were announced? So take this one. If you guessed uh, late 1986, well, yeah, treat yourself to a cookie. It's it's not an obvious answer. <clears throat> I'll get to this particular energy crisis uh, at the end of my talk. Uh, or uh, what about this one? So when did the geophysicist and peak, uh, peak oil icon King Hubbard think that we'd entered the crisis stage in the evolution of our energy minerals culture? Well, actually, uh, when didn't uh, King Hubbard think that? Uh, I mean, uh, this particular talk was from 1960, uh, but here he is in 1977 taking a victory lap because the consensus had finally shifted, at least in that brief moment in the wake of the 73 embargo. Uh, and he was now seen as having been right about peak oil all the way back in uh, 1948. So Hubbard perpetually thought we were in an energy crisis. Sometimes people listen to him, sometimes not. So for instance, when do we think this convention of real estate developers wanted to hear Hubbard's thoughts on uh, the energy crisis? Well, it turns out mid-September 1973, several weeks before the Arab-Israeli war started, more than a month before the embargo began. So developers at least, had the feeling that an energy crisis was looming already in the summer of 1973 when they invited Hubbard to speak. So these examples tell us that there are always a few people like Hubbard saying that we're currently in a crisis, and there are perpetually episodic outbreaks where lots of people think we're in an energy crisis. Uh, these examples also tell us that the particular crisis that we now associate with the embargo was foreseen months before and to some extent was even underway well before the embargo. So I would argue that the reason uh, for these episodic energy crises is largely that there are structural factors, especially having to do with Middle Eastern countries' relationships with each other and with the world, that haven't changed much over several decades and that therefore occasionally erupt, as indeed, unfortunately, we've seen in the past couple of weeks. <clears throat> 
So take, for instance, this press release, which talks about, quote, hostilities in the Middle East, the cutoff of Arab oil. What year is this? It's maybe not that hard to guess that it's from early 1968, but the events it describes sound like those of 1973 because the factors that converged in 67 were much the same as those in 1973. Or earlier, uh, here's Charles Spar, chair of Standard Oil of Ohio, explaining in 1970 that, well, embargoes of Middle Eastern oil just happen, folks. Get used to it. Uh, similarly, here's a Speaker of the House, Carl Albert, in September of 1973, uh, saying that, hey, Harry Truman tried to warn us about dependence on uh, foreign oil in 1949. Uh, interestingly, we see Albert already, again before the embargo, trying to refute the conspiracy theories about oil companies that we usually associate uh, with the embargo. And Meg has uh, nicely delved into that uh, in her book. Such gestures to crisis uh, sometimes pointed backwards, like Albert's and Spar's, but also sometimes forward. So here's George McGee, uh, an oilman and a diplomat, uh, saying in 1976 that there isn't really a crisis in the U.S. now, but there will be soon, and, quote, we should have started yesterday to address it. And here he is, uh, way back in 1957, saying pretty much the same thing. Uh, in particular, in 1957, McGee was already calling for, quote, the West to assure alternate sources of supply of energy. So acute fluctuations in price crises uh, should be placed in the context of factors that operated on a longer time scale and that evolved very slowly, even if occasionally they triggered rapid cascades of events. Of course, the particular cascade of events in 1973 was different crisis talk grew over the course of that year in ways that hadn't really happened before, right? So here's resources for the future in January of 1973. In April, uh, Iron Age declared a fuels crisis, uh, energy memo, hydrocarbon hunger, and James Aikens, U.S. ambassador to Saudi Arabia, warned that, quote, the oil crisis, this time the wolf is here. We've also, from that month, got a very interesting, to me, speech uh, by uh, Carl Rolander, a vice president at Gulf Oil, saying, well, we've got an energy crisis. It can't be solved with oil alone. So, quote, can nuclear take the heat off of oil? And from June of 73, uh, Dean McGee, uh, president of Kerr McGee, quote, assessing the energy crisis. Note that Kerr McGee was a mid-sized Oklahoma oil company that moved into uranium mining and refining in the 1950s. Karen Silkwood was employed by a Kerr McGee subsidiary. So McGee's answer to Rolander's question was, yes, definitely, nuclear can and should take uh, the heat off oil. And McGee had been saying that for a very long time uh, by 1973. So the heat built incrementally through 1973. And in many insiders' eyes, it had come to a boil by September, if not earlier. That perhaps wasn't apparent to ordinary consumers. It's certainly not how we've come to remember things. Meg has just done a great job of explaining uh, why that was. For myself, I want to focus on what could have come about as a result of the 73 crisis and lay the blame for the disappearance of that alternative timeline on the mid-1980s oil crisis that I started with. So what did people in 1973 and in the rest of that decade think the energy crisis should lead to? Well, remember George McGee encouraging the West to assure alternate sources of supply back in 1957. At that time, McGee, uh, George McGee, uh, meant alternative sources of fossil fuels. But even back then, King Hubbard, Dean McGee, and lots of other oil industry insiders thought that nuclear would have to take the heat off of oil eventually. As the Middle East became less stable and OPEC became more assertive in the late 1960s, oil companies also started developing solar and geothermal energy, wind power, biofuels, and fuel cells, and promoting conservation of energy. By the next crisis in 79-80, there was remarkable consensus across the oil industry ranging from the most liberal to the most reactionary voices on how to assure these alternate sources of supply. As summarized in a 1980-81 uh, speech 
uh, by uh, Raleigh Warner, chair of Mobile. So in the speech, uh, Mobile, uh, Warner starts off by saying, well, there's plenty of oil, but it's too concentrated in countries that might be tempted to trigger another crisis. So first, we need to find more oil and gas in territory controlled by the US and its allies. Maybe not that surprising, right? But then he goes on to say, we need to a shift from oil to coal wherever possible. And this was an era when oil companies were taking over the US coal industry and moving its center from Appalachia to uh, the Mountain West. And third, Warner says, well, let's, let's nuclear, let nuclear take the heat off of oil. And fourth, let's replace oil with exotic hydrocarbons, coal slurries, oil shale, tar sands, et cetera. Again, maybe not that surprising. But then finally, Warner, quite a conservative guy, he says, let's bring alternative energy into the mix. Albeit, we need to be realistic that that's going to take time. How much time? Well, the general feeling was sometime after 2000, but before the middle of the 21st century. In other words, our historical present. And really, that's turned out to be a good guess. <clears throat> All of the companies, oil companies in this slide, and many more, were investing heavily in solar and other renewables in the 70s and 80s in order to make those projections come true. Here's a table showing uh, which companies were doing what in this period. But of course, today's growing feasibility of solar doesn't owe that much to the oil industry, and in fact has been achieved despite much oil industry undermining, both overt and covert, of the investments, regulations, laws, and political and cultural capital needed to stimulate renewables. So something happened to dismantle consensus that formed between the two oil crises of the 1970s. And that's something I argue was the 1986 impending energy crisis that I started with. I took that phrase uh, from a Department of Energy presentation. Here are a couple more excerpts showing that the impending crisis of high oil prices, prices that were predicted for the 1990s were uh, predicted to result from the current mid-1980s crisis of low prices that threatened the dissolution of the U.S. oil industry and threatened 10 to 100 percent cuts in oil firms' research capacity. Now, you might say, well, that's the Department of Energy, you know, they're prone to dire predictions, but, you know, here is Mike Halbuti, a prominent wildcatter and uh, Ronald Reagan's energy guru, warning much the same thing, warning that the wave of 1980s mergers and acquisitions in the oil industry precipitated by the low price countershock was going to endanger the industry's R&D capacity. And you can guess which R&D programs were eliminated first, the ones in renewable energy that everyone agreed would only become competitive 20 plus years in the future, too long for impatient investors like T. Boone Pickens, Carl Icahn, and Ivan Boesky. So to summarize, uh, 1973 was in some ways unexceptional in that oil crises are a routine feature of modern life. Admittedly, 73 was pretty bad, though probably the embargo played a relatively small role in making it worse. Cuts in OPEC production, production and the inability of US production to fill the gap were more to blame. Even before 73, and even more so after, most of the major pl players in the oil industry, and by no means only the biggest companies, uh, began seeking alternatives that would make the U.S. and its allies less dependent on Middle East oil. Those alternatives included coal and nuclear in the medium term, but with a clear expectation that solar would join the energy mix in a major way sometime around our present, which has roughly happened. But since the mid-1980s, without the oil industry's full commitment, and indeed since the late 80s, despite vigorous opposition from much of that industry. In other words, I would argue the real energy crisis that casts a shadow over us today is perhaps not the high price crisis of 73, or not only that crisis, but also the low price crisis of uh, the mid-1980s. Thanks. Cyrus, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for giving us some really helpful context there. Not one crisis, multiple decades of crises.
and uh, lots of different things going on in the, within the oil industry uh, around before, during, and after 1973. So I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about in the panel. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Okay, we're rolling right along. Um, and again, just a um, an invitation to anyone in the audience to uh, throw your thoughts in the chat. Um, if you want to make an observation or send some praises to our speakers, I'm sure they would love to hear that. Or if you want to uh, join in conversation, please go ahead and do that in the chat. And if you have a very specific question uh, for any of the panelists, go ahead and throw that in the Q&A. And I already see some of those coming in, so that's terrific. Okay. So um, now um, I will invite um, Richard Hirsch to go ahead and turn on his camera and start sharing his slides. And uh, I will introduce him. And before I do that, just a very brief programming note. Um, depending on when you saw the advertisement for this program, you might be expecting to see Dr. Julie Cohn here. And sadly, uh, Julie had a death in the family and had to withdraw from the program. And so we send her our condolences. Happily, Richard Hirsch was able to step in and join our program on short notice. And so we really thank you, Richard. And so with that, let me just uh, introduce Dr. Richard Hirsch. Mm -hmm. Richard F. Hirsch is professor of the history of technology and of science and technology studies at Virginia Tech. Richard began his career writing about astronomy before turning his attention to the history of electric power networks. Richard has published three monographs on the subject, including Technology and Transformation in the American Electric Utility Industry, published 1989. Power Loss, The Origins of Deregulation and Restructuring in the American U Electric Utility System, published 1999. And most recently, Powering American Farms, The Overlooked Origins of Rural Electrification, published last year, 2022. So Richard, we're grateful that you could join us today. And when you're ready, take it away, sir. Very good. Are you able to see my screen at this point? Looking good. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, here's what I plan to do today. I will argue that the energy crisis of 1973, which caused huge social and economic dislocations to, the, uh, to America, also spurred creation of new energy policies that reverberate with us today. In particular, I'll talk about an obscure law passed during the Carter administration that had significant but unanticipated consequences for deregulation of the electric power sector. At the same time, the law provided substantial incentives for research and development on renewable energy technologies. First, a little background. For much of the 20th century, the electric utility system was viewed as an engineering and business success story. Utility managers exploited new technologies to provide an increasingly necessary commodity that became essential in our modern lives. Power companies met growing demand for electricity with incrementally improving technologies that also enabled prices to decline. They made growing profits while customers saw lower per unit prices. It was a wonderful situation for everyone involved, and the utility managers were viewed as stewards of technological progress. And when I say that electricity prices declined, they really declined. In real terms, electricity dropped in price by about 98% in the years between 1892 and 1972. That's pretty impressive. And even as overall prices for goods increased, electricity prices dropped, as one can read in this 1959 advertisement. This was a wonderful trend, obviously. But the wonderful days of the electric utility system were coming to an end, in part because of technological stasis, the apparent end of improvements in the technologies that enabled costs to decline. In this graph, you will see that the thermal efficiency improvements for power plants, a major source of cost reductions, plateaued in the 1960s. So I'm sort of pointing to the average power plant that reached about 35% efficiency in converting fuel into electricity. Likewise, utilities previously obtained lower costs by expanding the size of turbine generators and power plants known as economies of scale. But the former growth in the size of these generators stalled in the 1970s, as this graph shows. In other words, 
two of the major drivers of declining costs, thermal efficiency improvements and the increased scale of turbine generators no longer existed. As technological stasis occurred, the energy crisis hit. Energy prices shot up dramatically, as Megan Cyrus have pointed out, for oil and alternatives such as coal. Unlike in earlier days when improving technologies enable tech, uh, enabled utilities to mitigate price hikes in the general economy, the increased fuel prices meant that overall electricity prices rose too, as is illustrated in this graph. We can see here the end of the trend toward decreasing prices and the dramatic increases in prices in the 1970s. From 1972 to 1978, nominal prices increased 88%, and that's quite a bit. So we don't just see prices going up for gasoline, we also see prices going up for electricity. The 1973 energy crisis motivated Presidents Nixon and Ford to introduce new energy policies. I think most historians, though, agree that President Carter took energy matters more seriously than others, making it a big part of his policy making during the first years of his administration. Though it took 18 months of wrangling, President Carter managed to win passage of five laws that reframed energy policy in 1978. The most uninteresting and unobjectionable of those laws was the Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act, which sought to encourage more efficient use of electricity by reforming the way we pay for electricity using so-called rate structures. Here you see a traditional rate structure in which customers paid less per kilowatt hour as they consumed more electricity, a structure that made sense when production costs declined steadily. But this rate formula encouraged people to use electricity in a wasteful fashion, so it made less sense during an energy crisis when we wanted to conserve fuel resources. This policy initiative was important, but it was pretty boring too, and most people in the utility industry didn't pay much attention to it. They were more interested in other provisions of Carter's energy policy embodied in other laws, such as requirements to burn coal instead of petroleum and natural gas in power plants. A small part of the law, known as Section 210, permitted non-utility companies to sell electricity produced using the so-called cogeneration process. Cogeneration involves production of heat for industrial activities such as in papermaking by first sending steam through a turbine generator to make electricity. The waste heat is used for manufacturing purposes such that the raw energy used yields two useful products, heat and power. By contrast, a traditional utility plant dumps the waste steam from a turbine generator such that the overall efficiency of using fuel is much lower. For many years, industrial cogeneration companies employed the electricity to power their facilities, and if they had excess electricity, they generally couldn't sell it, so it was wasted. But Carter's policy team hoped that this provision of PURPA would yield more electricity without, without the increased fuel consumption by forcing utilities to buy the otherwise wasted power. At the same time, the law included a provision for the same new rules to apply when non-utility companies produced power from renewable energy sources, such as from the wind and sun. Thrown in at the end of the process of writing energy bills, this pr provision received little attention, but had huge consequences. Those consequences included much more research, development, and deployment of renewable energy technologies. States such as California added their own incentives for these PURPA producers, such that wind and solar technologies evolved rapidly in the 1980s and later. Here you see pictures of solar photovoltaic cells on a home and a less conventional system known as, a sol as solar trough generation along with a picture of a cluster of wind turbines built in the 1980s. These scattered power technologies are often called distributed uh, generators since they differ so markedly from utility plants that generated large amounts of power in stations that had much smaller footprints. As non-utility companies started taking advantage of purpose provisions, they demonstrated that utility companies no longer had a monopoly on the generation of electricity. These small 
entities produced electricity and sold it into the grid. Effectively, the PERPA producers challenged the notion that only regulated monopolies could generate power. The realization that non-utilities could produce electricity efficiently, even without large-scale power plants, suggested to policymakers that maybe utility companies should no longer be considered natural monopolies. Power companies won that designation early in the 20th century, when only large companies could exploit economies of scale and produce electricity in the most efficient and cost-effective manner. To ensure that these firms did not exploit their monopoly power, states created regulatory bodies that supposedly monitored the companies and the rates they charged. But the existence of non-utility companies taking advantage of PERPA suggested that natural monopoly no longer existed. And some people, such as the president of one utility, whose quote is shown here, argued that if utilities were no longer natural monopolies, why should they be regulated? Why not deregulate them and allow market forces to bring down the cost of power? The move toward deregulation gathered further momentum after the Gulf War, when President Bush signed the 1992 National Energy Policy Act. Among its goals was the use of free market mechanisms to increase the availability of energy supplies and lower their cost. The law also made it legal for states to deregulate the retail sale of power to allow customers to shop around for the lowest cost generators of electricity. And indeed, several states started to investigate the possibility of allowing customers to buy from new vendors of electricity. In March of 1998, California started, started its deregulation experiment, which seemed to go well for a couple of years. Several other states followed suit, such that by March 2001, 23 states had passed restructuring legislation, and many others had begun the process to do so. It seemed that the future of electric power lay in deregulation. Unfortunately for deregulation proponents, things didn't work out as hoped. The legislation creating a deregulated market in California turned out to be deeply flawed. It capped prices to consumers for the first few years, leaving utilities to deal with unexpectedly high fuel costs that appeared in 2000 and 2001, in part because of the work of companies such as Enron that deliberately distorted markets so they could make lots of money. Consequently, wholesale prices, the prices paid by utilities to serve their customers, jumped to above what utilities could charge. At one point, as this graph shows, the Pacific Gas and Electric Company paid $317 per mega megawatt hour of electricity, but because of the price caps, the company only earned $60 per megawatt hour from customers. In other words, it lost a huge amount of money every time people used or bought electricity. In large part because of such problems, PG&E went bankrupt in 2001. Similar problems with other companies contributed to ro uh, rolling blackouts, only to be resolved after the state took over the electricity market and effectively ended deregulation there. As a result of Californians, California's deregulation debacle, several states stepped backwards or slowed their pace of restructuring. These two maps show that within three years of the California electricity crisis, many states that had actively pursued deregulation in the dark blue on the left-hand map, suspended or delayed deregulation efforts, as shown in blue and green on the right map. The yellow states were either investigating deregulation uh, or, not de or not investigating, but many of them backtracked on deregulation overall. So what's the status of restructuring today? Not every state had the same problems as California, and a few states permit residential customers to shop for generation resources. Several others permit wholesale, commercial, and industrial customers to buy power from whomever offers the best deals. But not everyone is happy, especially as rates have increased in recent years. As the New York Times headline from a few months ago suggests, rates in deregulated states may have increased faster than those in traditionally regulated jurisdictions. So one of the legacies of the energy crisis, electric power deregulation, has seen mixed results, and that's a charitable assessment. What about other consequences? How about purpose impact on the development of renewable energy technologies? 
Well, here there's a happier story because purpose spur to renewable and distributed energy technologies remained a powerful force. Development and deployment of renewable energy resources, encouraged also by the National Energy Policy Act and other legislation, has expanded dramatically as the technologies have produced electricity at lower and lower costs. This 2002 graph suggests that the stimulus to renewables had already done much to reduce the price of power produced by these technologies. And here you see a much uh, more recent graph with data on the declining costs of renewable resources. Since 2010, for example, wind turbine produced electricity dropped in price by more than 50% globally. Solar photovoltaic costs dropped about 85%, such that these sources are now in many instances cheaper than fossil fuel generated electricity. Because of these lower costs and government incentives, wind and solar have taken off. This graph shows that renewable energy sources yield more electricity today than coal or nuclear generated electricity. And in the near future, we can expect to see more use of distributed generation, employing wind and solar resources, but, but also increased use of batteries to store electricity from intermittent sources and to avoid the need to build new power line infrastructure. Here you see a recent headline detailing how a Vermont utility plans to use batteries as a way to avoid investment in that infrastructure. To summarize and conclude, the energy crisis came at a horrible time for the electric utility system. As incremental technological improvements came to an end, fuel prices after the 1973 oil embargo surged and electricity prices could no longer be brought down using traditional methods. In one response to the crisis, Congress passed the Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act of 1978, which unintentionally introduced elements of competition into a formally monopolized and regulated electric utility system. It also stimulated the use of renewable and decentralized energy technologies that have become increasingly popular. While one can take some comfort knowing that we now have a more diversified and environmentally friendly way of making electricity than we did in the 70s, we shouldn't feel too satisfied. The electric utility system in this country still faces huge challenges, especially as we pr prepare for more power consumption in electric vehicles and computer server farms, for example. It also struggles to build more transmission lines to get electricity transported from often distant wind and solar farms to load centers, as this headline suggests. Well, there's a lot more I could talk about. Hope I'm happy to do so uh, later. By the way, as uh, Eric pointed out, this talk was largely based on my book, Power Loss, which I wrote several years ago. More recently, I published Powering American Farms, which is a revisionist history of rural electrification in America. Um, both of these make great holiday gifts. Thanks so much for your attention. Wonderful, Richard, thank you so much. And always be promoting, I love that. Uh, <laughs> go for it, man, and, and yeah. we're here for it. So that's awesome. No, your scholarship is so, so yeah. great and we appreciate you sharing it. Yeah, so, Shame, um, self shameless self-promotion, sorry. No shame, man. We you, you write a book. Let's you want people to hear what you've got to say. So, uh, and this is the audience for it. So, really appreciate your great talk and a lot of great insights. Uh, Cyrus is way ahead of me, and uh, I was just going to invite both Meg and Cyrus to uh, to bring their cameras up and uh, to unmute. And um, and here's what we're going to do uh, as a panel. We're going to talk just uh, among ourselves here for a minute. We'll have a little bit of discussion. Uh, that will give our audience just a few minutes uh, to think of a few more questions. Uh, so, you know, we'll talk here as a panel for about uh, eight or 10 minutes or so, maybe less, because we have a lot of great questions and I want to make sure we get to those. So um, I was really struck um, in listening to all three of your awesome talks um, by the sense of kind of instability, uncertainty, vulnerability, uh, that was sort of present in the 70s and then that sort of seemed to continue uh, in the decades that followed, there seemed to be a certain amount of uncertainty for consumers, as Meg pointed out, like, am I gonna be able to get a tank of gas? Like how much, you know, can I pay my heating bill? 
um, there seemed to be a certain amount of uncertainty uh, within the oil industry. Cyrus pointed out there seemed like there were many different ways we could go. Is it about domestic production? Is it about alternatives? Um, many different paths they might have followed. Mm -hmm. And and as Richard just pointed out, there was all this uncertainty about like, okay, well, um, we've kind of hit uh, some stasis in terms of like, you know, how much efficiency you can get out of burning stuff to create energy. There also seems to be some uncertainty about like how much government regulation do we want? Do we want competition? And so it's kind of a big question, but, um, and I, maybe I'll start with Meg and then we'll go to the other two panelists is, you know, how would you characterize that sense of, of instability, uncertainty, vulnerability uh, for the people and the institutions that you study in this period? Uh, thanks for the question, and thanks to my co-panelists for their talks. Um, I think instability and uncertain and uncertainty are certainly elements um, and, uh, of the, this moment. And as I was suggesting, that might even be putting it too gently. Um, so, uh, because it, it is, it it, it is. Um, really it's important to capture this sort of sense that all of a sudden everything could come to an end and um i mean i could have gone on and on and sort of widening um the perspective as to why that was the case and why the energy crisis was sort of the tip of the iceberg but one thing that the energy crisis did is that it encapsulated all these different arenas of uncertainty um, from um, domestic politics to foreign policy to concerns about the economy to concerns about uh, the environment to concerns about our social fabric. So, uh, you know, the idea that um, we that the United States could suffer an energy crisis as a result of um, Arab oil producers who up until that point we did not think had the power to do anything crippling to the United States came as a big shock and a big surprise. Uh, and that came, of course, right in the wake of Vietnam, which was a very unsettling thing for Americans, a very divisive thing for Americans. But regardless of what side you're on, the idea that America could no longer project its power into the world was then magnified by the energy crisis. So on the foreign arena, I talked a lot about the domestic arena. Um, that was certainly true, this idea that um, presidents could not be counted on and to deliver uh, stability, economic stability, that came as a as a big change too. And um, and also, I would say we didn't we haven't talked much about the environment, but this was also a moment where Americans and I saw some of the questions uh, in the chat were about this. this is an Ameri a moment before the energy crisis in which Americans were becoming aware of the environment. Congress passed a sweeping bill that Richard Nixon signed, um, the National Environmental Policy Act that said that man and nature should coexist peacefully. I mean, it was this sort of sweeping measure um, and it really sort of captured this vision that we could live in a world without trade-offs, um, that we could have health, that we could have beauty, uh, that we could have economic growth and all of that could happen at the same time. And the energy crisis just sort of exploded the myth on that as well too. Thank you. Cyrus, you wanna take that one? Where, what kind of instability, uncertainty, fear, I don't know how you would characterize it within sort of the oil industry at this time? Maybe there's not. Yeah, no, no, no. There's definitely a, a sense of doom. Um, I mean, one. Oh no, the, our transatlantic uh, internet cable may have been uh, blocked up here for a second. Let's see if uh, Cyrus comes back. Okay, we seem to have temporarily lost Cyrus for just a minute. Hopefully we get our internet connection back. Um, while we're waiting on that, Richard, did you wanna take a crack at that question? Sense of instability among the utilities, among the states, regulators, that kind of stuff. Well, 
you said it very nicely, Eric. One could, in fact, describe the history, recent history of electric power. The electric power system is as going from tremendous stability to instability. So in the years before the uh, energy crisis, before the 1970s, before technological stasis, everything was looking good. The utility industry had total, the utility industry managers had total control over all elements of its environment. Um, everything looked really good, of course. Then things changed, as I argued. So it went from a very certain uh, stable system to a very uncertain uh, and unst instable, unstable system. Um, and even though one could argue that there's been some return to stability with utility managers gaining more control over the system in the last um, 15, 20 years or so. Um, the, the utility system is still in a state of flux. There's so many things going on. I alluded to um, the, uh, the, the uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the impending use of more electricity, perhaps 20 plus percent more by 2050, just for electric vehicles, server farms. Okay, demand uh, may be increasing. Uh, I should also point out that all these uncertainties have also contributed to uh, sometimes a, amazingly novel policy initiatives. So when things are looking good, of course, you're not going to make big changes. But during the energy crisis, you saw um, huge changes in policy, huge uh, proposals for policy, such as those made by President Carter, and the policies that actually passed were relatively conservative uh, compared to what he thought um, early in his uh, administration uh, that would be needed. Uh, so uh, uncertainty, well, let, let's just say the uncertainty in the electric utility industry has has made it incredibly fun for me to study it. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily make it uh, wonderful for consumers and for policymakers, uh, but uh, uncertainty is the 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 among the watchwords these days. Terrific, thanks. And Cyrus, we're glad to see you back. Um, you were just winding up to tell us about the sense of doom, uncertainty within the oil industry. And you're back now, so why don't you pick up where you left off? Yeah, yeah. Speaking of instability, my computer decided this is a good moment to freeze up. But the, uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, one reason that uh, industry insiders were uh, talking about oil crisis, you know, so much, so many months before uh, ordinary consumers were, was that you know they could already see that there was going to be a problem with production and with access to uh, to oil, right? I mean. In, um, you're not an oil company if you don't have access to reserves, if you can't produce oil from somewhere. And, uh, you know, uncertainties about where those reserves were located and how companies were going to get access to them, those had been percolating up for quite a long time. Um, they sort of had hit different parts of the industry at different times. So one of the PhD candidates I work with on my project, uh, Michiel Brown, you know, he argues that, uh, you know, small and mid-sized U.S. companies already in the 1950s, they were feeling the pinch because the, the big companies had access to very cheap Middle Eastern oil, right? And that that's one of the things that's encouraging those companies to, uh, to diversify, right? They're uncertain that they can, you know, find new reserves out in the Gulf of Mexico cheaply enough to make a profit off them. So, you know, let's move into uranium mining and, and milling instead. Uh, but in the late 1960s, those, those uncertainties about access to reserves start to hit the majors as well, right? Because uh, first Libya and then the rest of uh, OPEC starts to say, well, we want more of a stake. We want more, uh, you know, returns per barrel, you're not going to make nearly as much of a profit off of uh, our reserves as, as you're used to. Uh, and so, you know, from 69, 70, and increasingly he, uh, by uh, early 73, oil companies can see that, yeah, that's going to be a big, big, big problem for them coming up. And that U.S. domestic production is just not going to be able to, uh, uh, to fill the gap. And they don't really know yet <laughs> where they're going to go next. Maybe Alaska, but again, there's lots of uncertainty there about building a pipeline. Maybe the North Sea, but yeah, technologically, uh, 
uh, that's a very uncertain area to get oil out of. So yeah, these these uncertainties have been building for a very long time by 73. Right on. Thanks to all of you um, for addressing that question. I'm going to start going to the audience questions because I have to say I've done you know a handful of these programs over the years. We've gotten some of the most awesome, intelligent questions uh, coming in for a program that I've been involved with. So I'm just going to I'm just going to roll with some of those. Um, there's a couple of questions here I'm going to kind of combine um, about this notion of crisis. Uh, Meg talked about this really nicely in her talk. Um, so one um, attendee asks, um, and I'll combine these two questions before you answer. It says, uh, how do you think about crisis as a social reality versus a method for framing social realities? I'm thinking here about Janet Reutemann's book, Anti-Crisis. Mahmoud Farouk from CISPO says, who benefits from crisis? Are crises always bad? Can crisis be creative and useful? What happens when we overplay crisis as a policy lever? I, I was also really struck about this idea that there was, you know, there wasn't this single point in time, right? We're talking, you know, we've used 73 as the sort of framing for this symposium. But as you guys nicely pointed out, there's all this stuff happening all the time, right? There's like blackouts and, you know, we didn't even talk about like Three Mile Island. Like there's all kinds of stuff happening um, in the energy sector over a long period of time. And so I guess the question I would throw out, and I don't know if anyone wants to volunteer to go first on this one, but like crisis is a sort of framing tool. Um, you know, can crises be useful to spur action? And whoever would like to go first, uh, go for it. I can also pick on someone. <laughs> I'm happy to answer. I'm happy to go first. Uh... It's a social reality, but it's also a politically constructed reality. That's what I would say. Um, uh, unlike my panelists and, and maybe many of your audience members, I'm a political historian. And that's uh, what I write mostly about. That is, how did this become a political crisis? Uh, and um, and I think you make a mistake if you leave policy and politics out of energy discussions and just think that these are sort of technological, sociological phenomena. So um, I would say that the construct of crisis uh, was really tinged with different sets of public policies from the oil industry, um, as Cyrus was talking about. So, uh, it is what allows um, George H.W. Bush to become um, first successful Republican to win a congressional seat in Texas and build the Republican Party in Texas by appealing to these smaller oil producers um, because they want a revision uh, of, of public policy. Um, and it is also what motivates the uh, majors also uh, towards the late 60s and 70s, because they feel, too, that they want different public policies that will benefit them, um, not least of which some concerns over the new environmentalism. And then once the uh, energy crisis hits in 73, it's then a, a, a very much a political football. And so there's a moment, for example, when Richard Nixon announces the crisis is over. Um, and that's just widely ridiculed. Uh, and 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 the public sort of sees this as a stunt to sort of you know have the president you know come across in a in a positive light. On the other hand, um, when Carter comes into office and it's 1977, um, he and he wants to build momentum for a new energy policy. He's trying to say there is a crisis and the public doesn't think there is one. So um, it's a it's a, an ever shifting political reality is what I would say. Cyrus, you want to go on that notion of crisis? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have a huge amount to add, uh, except just to, to say that I, I'm sort of ambivalent about, um, you know, the use of crises as, as a lever. Uh, for these kinds of discussions, uh, and specifically the 73 crisis. I mean, I, I tried to get across in my talk that, uh, you know, 73 could have led to something like we're seeing in the present, but but earlier, uh, and, and without a lot of the resistance that we've seen. Um, uh, 
But, you know, I think Meg and, and other uh, historians have um, made a good argument that that 73, you know, contributed greatly to a kind of neoliberalization uh, of the economy that has made action on climate and renewables uh, more difficult. So, yeah, 73 <laughs> is a very mixed bag and, and crises in general, I think. Um, yeah, they're they're a difficult tool. It, it, they don't have linear outcomes uh, if you want to use them as a tool. Richard, yeah, and yet of course uh, people did use the energy uh, crisis of '73 and other crises later to pursue uh, pursue goals. You know, they did exploit the crisis. I think it was Winston Churchill who said you shouldn't ever let a a good crisis go to waste. Something like that. Um, I think. Uh, I think a bunch of environmental groups or environmental advocates, energy efficiency advocates uh, took advantage, if you want to use that word or that phrase, to, um, to pursue their goals and were legitimized uh, and, and had their goals seem more or uh, become more mainstream because of these energy crises. Um, energy efficiency and and environmentalism was sort of a fringe group, a fringe movement to a large extent, I think, until the energy crisis, when it appeared that energy efficiency and renewable energy systems, for example, uh, could help us out of the crisis. So, um, yeah, people, it is a mixed bag, to be sure. Uh, but we did see lots of innovative policy after the 73 energy crisis. Nice. There's a series of questions um, that I'll try to combine here, if I can, that has to do with sort of um, the role of government versus the role of private industry. And maybe in the case of utilities, I don't know if you would agree with this, Richard, This it's kind of both, right? Like it's like um, a kind of regulated monopoly or something like that. But first part of the question is, you know, where do you see the, the role or the locus of innovation? Right, so you've got um, the legislation that Richard mentioned that's sort of spurring private industry to, um, you know, uh, pursue innovations uh, in alternatives. Cyrus talked about that nicely. The oil companies are kind of investing in solar and other alternatives, things like that. Um, so there's a question of, you know, but then the U.S. also has like national laboratories and this kind of stuff. So first question about role of government versus private industry is like locus of innovation. And then I think the second part of that question is role of government in terms of um, versus the market, right? So do we want to have price controls? Like we did them, but we didn't really believe in them. <laughs> Nixon, all this, you know, Meg talked about that nicely. Um, sometimes competition, the market creates more innovation, right? So, you know, uh, monopolies tend to stagnate in terms of innovation. So it's kind of a big question, but um, I, maybe I'll start with Richard here. So role of government mm. versus role of market in terms of locus of innovation, mm. competition versus regulated monopoly. How do you see yeah. it? If I could answer that question <laughs> definitively, I'd be a very wealthy person, I think, certainly as a consultant. Um, I only you, ask the easy questions, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, the softball uh, questions. So uh, the utility industry has been embroiled and and in uh, well there there's uh, government and private entities have been involved with the electric utility industry since the very beginning there's uh, this uh, both conflict and uh, and cooperation uh, between the two um, you know who needs innovation in the electric utility industry when the industry itself is doing so well to produce more than enough electricity at lower and lower costs. And indeed, regulators didn't have much to do uh, for many years, except to approve rate decreases of these companies. Once things changed, of course, then, um, uh, then there were novel policies that tried to get market forces working to encourage innovation. I don't think that's what PURPA was designed to do, but certainly uh, President Bush's Energy Policy Act of 1992 sought to use market forces. Um, electricity is something that some people think is so important and vital to everyone in this in the world that it, it's too vital 
to just let the free market handle it exclusively. So there's always going to be some form of oversight by the government, at least in this country. Um, and you know how one negotiates that private and government relationship is is still being decided. Cyrus, you want to take a crack at that one? Sure. I mean, if you um, look at oil industry executives' uh, speeches from the 70s, uh, they're filled with complaints about government. Uh, you know, they 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 want government to do something different. Meg already talked about this a little bit, mm -hmm. but um, at least at that point, they're not saying government should just go away. Uh, I mean, they're pretty desperate for government to be a reliable partner uh, in in a certain way, right? They have a certain vision of government, but they but that vision includes government being there. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, as you read these speeches, as they go on through time, by, by 79, by 80, uh, you get a real sense that they, they've given up on seeing government as a, ever being a reliable partner. Um, you know, I, in my presentation, I really sort of pinned their exit from things like solar energy on the, the counter shock of the 80s. But at, at least part of it also is that, um, uh, you know, a lot of companies that had solar subsidiaries in the 70s uh, relied in part on government funding or had hopes that government would be a you know major market uh, or at least, you know, would uh, partner with them around pre-competitive R&D and that kind of thing. And by the 80s, yeah, that's there's no sense of, of that. Um, and, and then that's when they really pull the plug on a lot of these ventures. So something major changes in, in the way people in industry are thinking about um, yeah, this question of where the locus of innovation is. At the beginning of the 70s, they see it as more a shared project than they do by, by the 1980s. Cool. Meg, role of government um, versus private industry versus market. Well, I'll take the big view on this. Um, uh, my last book was about the 1970s, but now I'm writing a book about the New Deal and World War II, uh, which is a very different moment in our history of government business relations. Um, and, uh, you know, that moment of innovation in the 1930s in the energy sector came with rural electrification, which was uh, pushed by the New Deal. Oh. And um, there, and so that was a significant moment of innovation. Um, and then it is to jump ahead um, today, you know, we're seeing another moment of a huge infusion of government into um into alternative energies uh to try to uh respond to climate issues today so um you can't do any of this without the private sector but i think that there are select moments uh when government comes in uh and really changes the direction terrific um it's 2:22 I'm keeping my eye on the clock and uh, I'm going to ask each of you to limit your responses to 10 seconds. We're going to do a, a very quick lightning round here. Just one quick question, but it's a big one. So it's going to be a challenge. So the value of history to inform policy, right? Tragically, we're seeing some um, echoes of 1973 where there's conflict in the Middle East again, uh, energy, you know, the war in Ukraine raised energy prices, you know, gas prices went high, instability, yada, yada, you know, all kinds of uh, echoes. So, you know, I would just ask you each for a word, uh, 10, 15 seconds on the value of history to inform policy. I'll start with Meg. I think history is very valuable because you can uh, see where things went right, but you can also see where things went wrong. And I know that sounds sort of generic, but um, I think one of the uh, virtues is to understand how did Americans actually perceive this and what were the challenges for policymakers at the time as a way of informing policy today? Fantastic. Cyrus Modi, 10 seconds, go. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the big uh, point of constructivist um, social science and humanities is that uh, it, it could be otherwise. And, uh, you know, history offers us lots and lots of examples that it was once otherwise. Uh, and, and also in the past that people had an idea that it would be otherwise today. Uh, and that therefore, yeah, it could again be otherwise in the future. Perfect. Thank you. Richard Hirsch, 10, 15 seconds, value of history to inform the present. Well, as, as Meg points out, uh, history makes one sensitive to causes and effects in the past, and some of those causes and effects can uh, uh, occur in the present day and in the in the future. Uh, if there's one thing I, I would say that policymakers need to be aware of is to be careful about unintended consequences. Be very careful when one writes legislation or policy, because someone's going to find a way to exploit that policy in unintended ways. Man, you guys were great uh, holding your answers very briefly. I really appreciate it. And I hope um, the folks online will join me in thanking and appreciating our terrific session one panelists. I learned so much today. Thank you so much, Meg Jacobs, Cyrus Modi, Richard Hirsch. Thank you all for sharing your expertise with us today. Great. Okay, so now, uh, before we start session two, we're going to pause for what was going to be a 10 minute break, but because I went too long, it's now going to be like a six minute break. <laughs> so um, we're going to leave Zoom running, uh, but feel free to step away, take a little break. And um, if you do stick around, uh, you can enjoy this slideshow with a few images that we pulled together that harken back to the energy crises, plural, of the 1970s and the last five decades of energy innovations. And so uh, our moderator, Arthur Demrich, will kick off and reconvene session two, starting at 2.30 Eastern time. So thank you so much to session one. We'll see you back here in five, six minutes for session two. Thanks. <laughs>
Well, good afternoon, everyone, especially those on the East Coast. Uh, good morning if you're still in California, um, and good late evening if you're Europe or elsewhere. Um, my name is Arthur Demrich. I'm the director of the Arizona State University Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes. We're a group here in Washington, D.C., and one of the key things we do is try to convene policy-oriented discussions that bring some other perspectives into the discussion like we're doing today. Um, for those of you who are able to join us for the first session, you just heard a great set of historical perspectives on thinking about um, crisis and change in the oil sector. Um, in this session, we're going to talk about the present and the future. Um, as with the previous session, please use the chat box to kind of engage with other participants. And I encourage you to submit questions in the Q&A um, that I will then bring to our panelists. Um, the panelists will each speak for about 15 minutes first. Um, I'm going to do some moderated with discussion with them, and then we'll bring in the questions from the audience. Um, and for everyone attending, just know your cameras are off, or in any case are not broadcasting or recording, but the program is being recorded. Um, and let me start with our first speaker, Robinson Meyer. I'm going to introduce each speaker right before they speak, since um, you know if you hear all three, you kind of forget who's who. <laughs> as it goes. So, um, so yeah, it's my great pleasure to introduce Robinson Meyer. He is the founding executive director of Heatmap, a new media company that's focused on energy and climate change. He was previously a staff writer at The Atlantic, where he covered climate change, energy, and technology, and he co-funded the COVID tracking project that many of you perhaps used. Um, he has been a visiting fellow in journalism at the University of Chicago's Energy Policy Institute and holds a BA from Northwestern University. Um, so, Robinson, you can probably share screen now and take over. Thank you so much. I think I need to. Um, I think I think there we go. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here, and I'm flattered to be invited. The only thing I would add is that um, I, I co-founded the COVID tracking project. It was my great pleasure. I wish I could have co-funded it. Uh, we relied on a on a fantastic set of foundations for that. Um, I wish I was in the in the position in life to to co-fund uh, it, but um, I uh, I simply brought the volunteers together. Um, I. Uh, Thank you so much uh, for having me. I am going to talk briefly about um, the energy outlook as we move our conversation to the present, um, specifically as we move it out of the 70s and to uh, you know what, what the energy terrain looks like today. And so I want to focus on three shifts um, in, in this talk, uh, three shifts that I think are kind of important, especially as, as like coming out of the previous historical conversation. The first is a shift that's happened across the economy. The second is a shift that's happened specifically in manufactured types of energy. And the third is the policy driven shift that we're seeing today. Let's first talk about the economy wide shift. I think one thing that is extremely important to, to kind of keep in mind as we come out of the 1970s and early 1980s moment is that you know, right now in the United States, that is right now in 2023, we're using more energy than ever before um, or, or, or nearly as much energy as ever, as ever before. Um, we're, we're kind of hovering in the, in the 90 uh, quadrillion B BTU range. Um, but it, even as U.S. total energy consumption has increased, what we found is that we are the actual energy intensity of GDP has declined and, and held steady. So um, or declined and then held steady recently. So U.S. primary consumption per real dollar of GDP has basically declined since the 70s and, and remained on a fairly stable glide path. If you were to look at the per capita uh, energy intensity of the economy, it has also declined. And I think that's important to kind of frame the entire conversation before we get further, because um, as compared to the 1970s or early 80s, um, 
energy, while an extremely important input to the economy, as we've seen during this presidential administration, uh, and an input that can still drive kind of macroeconomic trends that can drive inflation, is you know, successively kind of less important to actual GDP, to, to, to the entire economic output that we see every year. And that's, of course, due to a lot of factors that's due to a lot of the efficiency and energy conservation rules that went into effect during the 70s and 80s. It's also a result of just the changing composition of the economy, the shift away from manufacturing and toward services. So that's the first thing to frame. The second shift that I think is important to bring to this conversation is the manufacturing driven shift uh, that we've seen over the past uh, 15 years or so. So as, as the previous panel kind of began to talk about, the kind of biggest story in global energy over the past 10 years, other than the rise of the US as an oil producer and natural gas producer, um, has been this precipitous decline in what I would describe as the kind of manufactured energy production mode. So the, the, the most dramatic is in solar. So as you can see, solar um, uh, costs have fallen by 99.6% since 1976. That's not as impressive as I think the, the actually even more dramatic cost of uh, uh, decline that has happened since 2010 and, and since, the, since the Great Recession. Um, we've also seen that in batteries. So since 1991, the cost of batteries has fallen by 97%. Most notably, that's really continued through this decade. Um, and what's, I think, most interesting about these cost declines is that we, you know, we don't see these kinds of cost declines in other forms of energy. So um, <clears throat> while there have been precipitous cost declines, there, there have been large cost declines in, let's say, natural gas, energy production in, in the US, uh, there have been enormous cost decline. You know, a, as you can see, cost declines from $359 per uh, megawatt hour to $40 per megawatt hour in solar voltaic, uh, similarly large cost declines in onshore wind, such that if you look at the levelized cost of energy, which for lots of reasons that I'm sure some listeners in the call can uh, describe for us, um, is not always the best measure of, of energy costs, but which can be a very useful measure of energy costs. But if you look at those energy levelized costs of energy, you can see that solar has declined and wind has declined in a way that like we haven't seen in the more commodity driven um, energy mode. So, you know, gas has fallen somewhat as the US has become a much larger producer of natural gas, but not in the same way that solar has. And as energy experts, and I think this, this kind of ad hoc community of energy policy wonks, climate advocates, um, journalists have tried to understand why this might be. They've kind of begun to understand it to be a result of a phenomenon that I, I've coined, but you can see other versions of it called uh, the green vortex. And that is this ability of policy to drive these manufacturing cost declines. So what we've seen across a number of, tech, across solar, across batteries, across wind to a lesser extent, is that you see a country pass cost cutting policy, the policy that subsidizes the, the, the cost of building out renewables, um, that drives greater production. As soon as companies begin to invest in greater production and produce more of that technology, whether it be solar or batteries, we see economies of scale begin to kick, can, kick in and you know, true organic non-subsidy non related cost declines kick in. Of course, as those economies of scale kick in uh, and the cost of that renew those renewables continues to fall, that can uh, drive greater deployment. As deployment increases, more companies get invested and more companies um, invest or commit themselves to, to building out renewables even further. And that corporate engagement, that corporate kind of interest in renewables, um, and not to mention a growing renewable sector, uh, whether on the deployment side or the manufacturing side, can fight for more policy, which can in turn drive more, you know, greater production. That's what we've seen in the U.S. with the continued extension um, and now the kind of almost permanent lock-in of uh, the solar and wind tax credits, but it's really what we've seen internationally. So 
in solar over the past 10 years, a lot of the cost declines in solar have been attributed to this kind of almost a long distance relationship between China and Germany, where China was able to use its manufacturing um, know-how, its economies of scale of manufacturing to, on the supply side, produce lots of solar panels, which then were kind of drawn out of China by um, German, the German feed-in tariff, German demand side solar incentives. So German demand side solar incentives drew greater uh, supply production in in China. Once China, um, you know, once those economies of scale kicked in in China, then there was greater deployment in Germany and around the world. That's actually kind of mirrors what we saw during the eighties and nineties in the, during the eighties and uh, with wind where Denmark's response to the energy crisis um, of the 1970s was to invest heavily in wind, um, but on the supply side, and they were able to feed a kind of infant market in California, which set up a lot of demand side supports to build onshore wind. And so with both of these renewable technologies, uh, one country kind of invested in the supply side, another country invested in the demand side, um, and they were there was almost a teleconnection between them, and they were able to drive a virtuous cycle of renewable deployment. I want to add again, this these cost declines are only possible um, in a manufacturing based energy regime, right? Because in a commodity-based energy regime, while there are cost declines over time, you don't quite see the same manufacturing related economies of scale kick in. Um, The final shift is the shift we're seeing now in the United States. So, you know, despite all those cost declines that we were just discussing in solar and batteries, um, you know, the U.S. remains primarily a fossil driven economy. So 81% of U.S. primary energy consumption last year came from fossil fuels. Um, you can see that despite the growing renewable share of the economy, um, if you want to take a longer view, uh, you know, a, a renewables are now returning to the to the larger role that they used to play in a kind of pre-fossil, pre-industrial revolution economy. Um, and just last year, we began for the first time on record, uh, those cost declines really began to show up uh, in, in a big way in the U.S., where more than half of new energy electricity generated capacity in the US came from wind and solar or just zero carbon electricity generally. Um, of course, the biggest shift that we've seen recently is the surprise passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, the Biden administration's climate law. And while you know I can't quite point, we don't have electricity generating capacity data for 2023 yet, although I can tell you from what we do have, there's a sense that wind might underperform, solar seems like it might continue to overperform. What we do have is is data on where financing is going and where investment is going from a new MIT consortium. And so what we've seen is that in announced clean energy investment in the US, uh, the past few years have absolutely blown what we uh, previous years out of the water. So there's been $213 billion of announced clean energy investment in the US. And that's on all sides. That's that's both rooftop solar, that's also, say, manufacturing investment in electric cars and batteries, um, that's utility scale, offshore wind investment, that's the entire clean economy. And that is, I should note, announced investment. But if you were to look at actual investment, that's actual places where dollars have started to flow, we've also seen record highs there. So I believe there's been $37 billion in actual investment um, in just you know the manufacturing investments by technology this year. The biggest shift that we've seen coming out of the IRA and, and in the post IRA world actually hasn't been in solar and wind as much as it's been in batteries. So if you look at where investment has happened in the in the kind of EV and battery ecosystem, um, it's been concentrated both in Michigan and kind of in the old Rust Belt, but also in this newly emerging battery belt uh, through Georgia, kind of up through Tennessee and, and maybe getting all the way over into Texas. Um, I think just as a as a journalist who's been observing these shifts, you know, frankly, the biggest change we've seen in the U.S. economy so far hasn't really been in solar and wind. It's been that, you know, three years ago, there was no guarantee that the U.S. would develop a homegrown or at least a, a significant manufacturing base in electric vehicles and in batteries, which is kind of a very related part of the value chain. 
uh, that's now kind of, there's no question that the US will have some form of large scale EV and battery manufacturing complex here. There's been about $60 billion of domestic EV and battery um, supply chain investment announced uh, just in the past two years. That being said, I think there are several questions related to the approach um, that the Biden administration has taken uh, and related to the kind of green vortex approach that we see in the IRA. The first is just, will the IRA stay on the books? Uh, as uh, I really appreciated Cyrus's point during the last panel, that it is the 1980s moment that kind of defines our energy realities as much as the 1970s moment. During the Carter administration, there were a ton of investments across energy R&D. In fact, that was our biggest previous moment for our energy R&D investment uh, uh, before now, basically. That's when the U.S. invested the most in energy R&D compared to now. Um, a lot of those investments, basically in everything that weren't fossil, were then killed during the Reagan administration or killed due to the uh, financial changes in the U.S. economy that Cyrus discussed. Um, of course, that R&D investment in oil and gas was really important because that gave us the fracking revolution about 20 years later. Um, but we didn't see it as much. We didn't see it sustained in the same way in uh, wind and solar and in non-fossil related energy technology. So we know that the U.S. can make big investments in energy that are then not sustained. Um, and I think the, the biggest question is simply, will the IRA be sustained? And that's going to depend, of course, immensely on the, the next election. The second question I have is, whether cost-cutting policy, such as the IRA is doing with its, you know, its subsidies playing the largest role in the IRA, we, we know that it can drive deployment, but can it drive decarbonization? So what we've seen, for instance, is that while renewables make up a larger and larger share of U.S. kind of build-out capacity, we just see that capacity handling kind of greater demand for electricity. We don't see that capacity and that renewable build-out beginning to cut into existing fossil um, demand. We don't see fossil demand decreasing, in other words. So what we've seen over the past 20 years is that cost-cutting policy can drive deployment across the economy and across the global economy, but it can't necessarily drive decarbonization. It can't take fossil offline. Um, there are going to be forthcoming EPA rules that try to take fossil offline in the U.S., um, I think it's an open question about whether those rules both survive past muster in the courts and then past muster from future political regimes. The final question is that, you know, as we discussed, the green vortex is something we've seen in limited national context so far. So we've seen China, for instance, be able to bring down the wind and the, the cost of solar and batteries significantly. We've seen Denmark and then China be, be able to reduce the cost of wind significantly. But right now, kind of every developed country in the world is trying to do the green vortex. They are they are investing in green growth and climate friendly industrial policy at the same time. And we really don't know what industrial policy or what you know the green vortex looks like when every country tries to do it at the same time. And I think it's going to produce some uh, big crashes in the global economy and some and some real uh, conflict between allies, as we've already seen, frankly, between the U.S. Europe and East Asia. Um, I, I don't think I need to discuss for this group how in the past energy crises have emerged not from domestic political context, but from international context. Um, it is just that international context that I think is most worrying when you look at uh, the energy policy that we have on the books here in the US. And for that matter, the energy policy that every other country has taken, which have all focused on kind of ways that energy that climate policy can generate domestic green growth um, and so our you know the biggest question I think going forward is what does it look like when every country tries to do the green vortex or every country tries to do climate friendly industrial policy at the same time I should add as a final note that these are exactly the questions we try to track at EatMap, the uh, energy and climate focused online magazine that I left the Atlantic to help found you can find us at eatmap.news we cover these kinds of questions every day otherwise thank you so much I'm looking forward to uh, discussing these questions further with the panel Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Robinson. And yeah, Robinson will rejoin us momentarily when we reconvene as a group. Um, I'm now really thrilled to introduce Kelly Cummins. She is the acting director for the Department of Energy's Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. OSED is managing more than $25 billion in funding for large-scale clean energy demonstration projects, 
Uh, Kelly joins us from the Department of Energy, where she has worked for two decades, holding leadership positions in the Office of Science, the National Nuclear Security Administration's Office of Defense Programs, and the Offense, Office of Defense Nuclear Nonproliferation. Uh, she holds a Master's of Science from Georgia Tech. Kelly, over to you. Great. Thank you so much. And let me see if I can share my screen here. All right. Hopefully everyone can see that. Just give me one second here. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the uh, introduction, Arthur, and for inviting me to join today. It is a great to follow Robinson, who, along with his colleagues at Heatmap, are real thought leaders on the clean energy transition. Uh, as, as Arthur mentioned, I'm Kelly Cummins. I have the privilege to serve as the acting director for the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. I've been fortunate enough to spend more than 20 years in the civil service focused on national security and energy security. Uh, enjoyed working on some of the most pressing issues of our time, including securing nuclear materials around the world after the fall of the Soviet Union. So when the Secretary of Energy called me in December 2021 and asked me to head a new office focused on the existential issue of climate change, I, I jumped at the chance and uh, really want to help change our current trajectory for the benefit of my sons and, and for many others. Uh, today, our focus at DOE and my office in particular fits squarely in today's topic of energy in innovations and what's over the horizon. So I'll start by sharing some information on the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations um, and uh, our ongoing work and also demonstrating uh, the innovative technologies, some of which we were just talking about, as well as some of the successes and challenges that lay ahead. So let me go to the next slide here. So in spite of and, and partially because of the geopolitics of the day, it's clear that the energy transition is firmly underway. And between uh, what Robinson just talked about, the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, the US government has made billions of dollars available to the private sector for American clean energy development and uh, deployment. And thanks to these historic climate laws, we're, we're stepping up with more than 25 billion in federal funding to demonstrate technologies through the establishment of the Clean Energy Demonstrations Office. Our goal is to really help scale the emerging technologies needed to tackle the most pressing climate challenges and to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. But as I'm sure you all know, this is a very uh, hard task, not easy at all. Uh, if we are successful, we will have delivered clean energy demonstration projects at scale in partnership with the private sector to help accelerate the deployment, the market adoption, and really importantly to us, the equitable transition to a decarbonized energy system. These technologies face significant barriers to scale, and we recognize that to achieve our climate goals, these investments are not enough by themselves. They must catalyze private sector capital to reach commercial liftoff across a range of technology areas. One of the challenges that we're facing now is how do we take these billions of dollars provided in the recent climate laws and leverage them into the hundreds of trillions of dollars of non-federal funding that is needed to achieve net decarbonization? How do we buy down that risk now in order to achieve scale up in deployment in the future? And to add to what Robinson just discussed, how do we make sure that the green vortex keeps spinning with learning by doing, learning by demonstrating, as we like to say, driving down those costs and leading to more companies wanting to adopt those technologies uh, or market lift off, as we like to say. We want those cost declines that Robinson presented on for solar and batteries across all of these clean energy technologies. So one way that we're helping to achieve market liftoff is to make significant investments in clean energy technologies where there is still scale up risk, there is still market risk, providing federal funding matched by private sector funding to demonstrate viability of the first few facilities or clean energy ecosystems. If successfully demonstrated, this would then spur a wave or hopefully a tsunami of follow on private sector investment that would fund hundreds of follow on facilities that are needed for decarbonization. And as you can see, we are making those investments today across a range of technologies, including clean hydrogen, 
carbon capture at power production and industrial sites and carbon removal directly from the atmosphere. We're also investing in advanced nuclear reactors as well as long duration energy storage, which becomes increasingly more important as we transition to a grid that is more powered by wind and solar resources. We're also investing in industrial decarbonization, focusing on subsectors that have the hardest to abate emissions, such as steel, chemicals, aluminum, cement, and many others. We need to abate these subsectors because we need them to affect change in other areas that are important for energy. You know, for example, steel is essential to wind farms and EV manufacturing. There is a connection among all of these activities. And speaking of synergies, as we increase renewable power on the grid and we start installing EV chargers and batteries and even solar at our homes, we're also investing resources to see how we can better manage all of these distributed energy systems so that we don't charge our cars at peak times and that potentially we can actually provide power from our homes back to the grid in certain circumstances. There are incredible opportunities across all of these areas, but the direct investment through financial assistance or grants is not enough. We know to get to true liftoff will require a combination of federal funding, the tax credits that were just mentioned, uh, supportive state regulations, decarbonization commitments from corporations, as well as international uh, cooperation. Uh, I would like, if I've got a few minutes, to briefly walk through a couple of these areas as examples and share some exciting recent announcements. So hydrogen, as many of you know, is the most common element, not only on the planet, but in the universe. It's versatile. It can be used for energy storage, fuel for heavy duty transportation, power generation, heating, industrial purposes like fertilization, uh, fertilizer, fertilizer production. Uh, most hydrogen is currently made using a carbon intensive process, but we can produce clean hydrogen by capturing and storing emissions from that process or by re using renewable energy to produce hydrogen through electrolysis or, or splitting water. Uh, last Friday in Philadelphia, we announced the largest investment in clean manufacturing and jobs in American history. Seven regional clean hydrogen hubs dispatched throughout the nation to accelerate the commercial scale deployment of low cost clean hydrogen. So we put $7 billion of investment from my office, and that is being met by more than $40 billion in private sector funds to establish this first ever network of clean hydrogen infrastructure. And this is really exemplifying what we aim to do, which is a private sector led, but government enabled strategy. Um, these hubs are going to produce 3 million metric tons of hydrogen annually. Uh, they're going to reduce 25 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions each year. That's about roughly equivalent to 5.5 uh, million gasoline uh, powered cars annually and a lot of great jobs. So with this investment, we're really trying to lay the foundation for the future. This graphic is a blueprint of what a hydrogen hub could look like connecting producers, connective tissue like transportation and pipelines as well as end users. Got one more slide, <laughs> you bear with me. And then hydrogen is an incredibly important lever for decarbonizing across several sectors. But you know, as Robinson just said, uh, deployment doesn't always lead to decarboniza decarbonization. So what can we do on the decarbonization front? So one of the other areas that we're also investing in is direct air capture. And this is an approach that is needed to achieve net zero emissions. And so this, really is, in layman's terms, essentially giant air vacuums that can suck decades of carbon pollution straight out of the sky. So we recently announced $1.2 in funding for two regional direct air capture hubs in Texas and Louisiana. And once we can harness that pollution, we can trap it permanently deep underground, and then maybe even eventually turning it into things like building materials, agricultural products, and even clean fuels like sustainable air fuel. Uh, deployed at scale, this technology can make a serious, can help us make serious headway towards meeting our net zero goals. And this may sound easy, but if you're capturing carbon directly uh, from a flu stack uh, at a power generation facility, it is fairly concentrated. In the atmosphere, it, it is the reverse. You know, imagine dropping one uh, drop of black ink to, into an Olympic sized swimming pool, letting it disperse, and then trying to get that one drop out again. And that's what we're trying to do with these uh, regional hubs. Um, so I will conclude by saying the obvious that with the ever present signs of climate change across the globe, there has never been a more critical time uh, 
for public and private sector collaboration and action than now. Look forward to answering your questions and I will turn it back over to Arthur. Thank you so much, Kelly. Really appreciate that. Um, and uh, it's really helpful to get that set of perspective. If you could stop your screen share, that would be great. As I introduce our next speaker is going to be Clark Miller. Clark is a professor and senior global futures scientist at Arizona State University in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society. Um, he has previously published quite extensively in the field of science and technology studies, including edited volumes and articles on climate change, nanotechnology, and science and democracy. But over the past decade plus, he's really turned to work on social drivers, dynamics, and consequences of energy system change. Um, he's director of the Center for Energy and Society and member of the National Academies Committee on Accelerating Decarbonization of the US Energy System. Um, and he holds a PhD in electrical engineering from Cornell University. Uh, welcome, Clark. Thanks, Arthur. Uh, really great to be here and great to have followed on uh, both Robinson and Kelly in this panel and the fantastic historical panel uh, that went first. Uh, you know, just quickly reference the, the last slide of Kelly's. Uh, we have the great pleasure of being one of the smaller hubs uh, that got some initial investment from that direct air capture hub uh, as well here in the in the Southwest. So uh, it's really an exciting time to be part of uh, the energy innovation space and these new public private partnerships that Kelly uh, was talking about. I wanna talk about, um, uh, I wanna jump off from uh, a point that Cyrus made in his very last answer uh, in the Q and A period in the previous panel, you know, where he talked about this idea that it could be otherwise. Uh, and the work that we've been doing for the last uh, uh, five years or so has, one of the things that we've really focused on is this question of how could it be otherwise uh, in the future? And, uh, and, and this question then that evolves from that, what kinds of clean energy futures might be possible? Uh, and, and why do we care uh, about what those different clean energy futures might be? Uh, I'm gonna focus on solar, but if this is a story that could be told about any of the new clean energy technologies uh, that Robinson and Kelly talked about uh, around the world. Um, this is just, following on their talks, highlighting uh, uh, the rapid uh, growth of solar worldwide. Uh, this is the latest projection from about mid-year from the International Energy Agency, uh, estimating uh, the 2023 investments worldwide uh, in solar PV technologies at something like 320 to 380 gigawatts, uh, which, <clears throat> As Robinson pointed out, uh, it's half of new power plant construction in the United States uh, by capacity, and it's half of new power plant construction worldwide uh, by capacity uh, as well. And solar has really accelerated and, and overtaken even wind uh, over the last few years. Just to put this in perspective, 330 gigawatts is a third of a terawatt. Humanity as a whole uses something like 15 to 20 terawatts uh, instantaneously, depending on how you count about it, how you count it. Uh, of course, a third of that gets thrown away immediately as heat from combustion. So our real use is more like 10-ish to 12-ish kind of terawatts. So we're now adding a terawatt of solar energy capacity uh, every three years. Uh, and the expectation on the growth side is that pretty soon we're going to be adding a terawatt every two years uh, of new solar capacity, um, which is almost, and I say almost, the pace at which we need to be deploying solar uh, in order to be uh, at net zero by 2050 and to maintain a net zero economy over the long term. Depends a little bit on how much of the future is electrified, meaning we use directly electricity uh, to power it, uh, 
and how much of the future energy system uh, continues to use fuels, which then requires us to take solar electrons, make those fuels, which is inefficient, burn those fuels or, or use a fuel cell, which is also inefficient. And so we need more solar if we're gonna use a lot of fuels in the future of the economy. So um, the other reason I like this graph is because the IEA, unlike almost everybody else, has both a light blue and a dark blue color on this graph. And those are solar PV in utility scale and distributed uh, um, uh, models. Uh, and it's important to think about both of them and to note that in the last few years, deployment of distributed PV and deployment of utility scale PV uh, have been almost co-equal. And this defies a lot of people's predictions from let's say 10 years ago, uh, when it looked like the sheer cost uh, uh, factor was gonna make utility scale the only sort of long-term solar solution. And what we're seeing is that the value of solar for the user is so high that it justifies for lots and lots of people, very high levels of investment even in more costly models uh, of distributed solar. Uh, and that's important because the question that we confront is not just how fast we're ad adopting clean energy, but also which clean energy future we're trying to build. And that's because these three futures, and you can see a utility scale plant at top, you can see some so rooftop solar in the middle, and you can see a community solar project that my colleagues, uh, Natra and Nalini Chetri have been doing in Nepal, uh, in the bottom, these are very, very different kinds of energy projects. If you think back to the things that Meg and Cyrus and Richard were talking about uh, in the first panel, which is how we design the energy system, not just which technologies we use uh, to drive it. These are very different futures from each other. And so are these. Uh, and I often uh, use this picture explicitly to point out that even if you put the solar panels in exactly the same physical locations and you produce exactly the same energy from those, you can weave those solar panels into our social and economic life in different kinds of ways and you get very, very different futures. So to play that out just a little bit more, uh, I call the, the left-hand column libertarian solar. This is where each individual household owns their house and they own the rooftop solar on top of that house. They're a little mini producer of energy. They're maybe engaged in peer-to-peer -peer trading of energy with their, their neighbors uh, out into the future, uh, right? It's a very model in which each of us is our own little economic agent, as libertarians like to suggest. The middle uh, column is the neoliberal solar model. These are solar leases, which in Phoenix are a substantial fraction of our total rooftop solar. This is where all those solar panels are owned by one individual. Uh, I use Elon Musk as, and, and, and Solar City and, and uh, Tesla as the, uh, you know, sort of the example of this, right? But this is where large companies own the, the solar. They also own the, the houses. So there are large tracts of, of houses in Phoenix now that are owned by Wall Street banks, for example, uh, that bought them up during uh, various of our housing crises and now rent them out, right? And so this is the, the neoliberal rentier economy model of the future of our economy. And then on the right, what you have is a neighborhood energy community uh, that has gotten together and collectively bought and installed a bunch of solar panels across the neighborhood. Uh, and that a neighborhood community then shares the revenue, shares the benefits of those solar panels across all of the people who live in the community, whether they rent or they own, uh, or they're otherwise part of uh, this neighborhood. Uh, and so you see, right, that these questions that Richard introduced us to, public power versus private power, uh, community solar versus, uh, versus uh, a kind of more libertarian or neoliberal model of rooftop solar make very big differences. And if you think about scaling out these different models to the scale of the United States, you know, uh, you know, some of these companies that are doing solar leases, for example, are making bids to be the largest producers of electric of electricity. Uh, in the United States by owning solar panels all across American rooftops. That's a very different future 
than one in which homeowners are producing their own electricity uh, and their own and generating their own revenues uh, from these solar uh, systems. This matters because among other things, in a carbon neutral future, the best estimates suggest to us that solar is gonna be something like 50 to 75% of primary energy generation. Uh, there was a 2020 paper by uh, uh, a, a, some colleagues of mine in the Quest Photovoltaic Engineering Research Center uh, that led by Sarah Kurtz that estimated we would need uh, something between 60 and 180 terawatts of total solar uh, photovoltaic energy on the planet to produce 50% of that world's primary energy uh, primary energy supply. Again, depending on whether we electrify most of the economy or continue to use fuels uh, in large fractions of the economy. So solar is going to be incredibly important. And so our choices that we make about how to layer solar into the rest of the economy and into our societies are really going to matter. Uh, and, and I want to highlight some of those uh, dimensions of those choices for you here very quickly to end uh, the talk. So one is just, you know, this is the city of Dubai. It's a city that's built on the oil economy. The political economy of the world is going to be in part how we organize the revenue streams of the future of the solar energy economy, the way that it has been wrapped up in the future of the oil economy of the past. And so one question is, will the solar industry be more concentrated than the oil industry or less concentrated than the oil industry when you think about where the money flows through it and when you think about where the power th flows through it? Urban living, urban design. Um, are we gonna build cities like this one in which we have very large integration of solar into the urban environment? Uh, and we are really thinking about the many, many multiple co-benefits of multi-use solar in urban environments, or are our cities instead going to continue to look basically like they look today, and they're going to just have giant solar plants out in agricultural areas, uh, in desert environments, and in other rural spaces uh, that feed solar power into the city. It's a huge design choice that has massive consequences for both urban communities and rural communities, how we think about that. Uh, so land use, what kinds of desert environments are we going to have uh, in the future? This is uh, a giant power plant in Morocco uh, out in the desert, uh, for example. Um, likewise, water environments, water floating solar is now the hot topic, although it's hard for me to imagine uh, that this really takes off uh, and becomes significant. On the other hand, water is 70% of the Earth's surface uh, and solar takes up space. And so there, there's you know, a very real possibility uh, that our water environments could be places where we do this, especially if, for example, this uh, has an impact on reducing evaporation from those, uh, those reservoirs. Um, supply chains, who and where gets sacrificed, as Richard told us, the future of solar is also the future of batteries. This is a lithium uh, mining facility in uh, Chile, northern Chile, right? With, and, and so lots of questions about this new future economy, about where the critical minerals come from. Uh, do we mine them here in North America? Make sure that we have secure supplies. Make sure that that mining is part of our own economy, is, is subject to our own environmental rules. Uh, or, uh, you know, and, and the real consequences that that will have for land here in the United States? Or do we continue the practice uh, of mining these minerals all over the world, subject to who knows what level of human rights oversight, environmental oversight, uh, et cetera? Uh, and again, to come back to my point about urban design, co-benefits, right? What kinds of, of ways can we take these solar environments and make them have multiple benefits for multiple different groups of people? Uh, this is a bike lane in, um, uh, in India uh, that's recently been built with a solar canopy overhead uh, to help encourage in an, in, a, in an environment that's not unlike the one I live in in Phoenix, where urban heat is an increasingly a significant issue that we're worried about, trying to help create environments where we can continue to do things like bicycle. Um, so which choices we make about how to design the clean energy future 
um, and whose imagination guides those designs matter as much as the question of how fast we can build out uh, a green energy future. And since everybody has been uh, plugging their books, I'll just end with uh, our two most recent books on uh, the question of what solar futures might look like. Uh, these two are uh, science fiction collections as well as essays uh, written by us, by photovoltaic engineers, and by folks at the National Renewable Energy Lab, and you can download them for free at the address at the bottom. So thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, with that, um, we are going to reconvene as a panel. Um, thank you, Clark and Kelly and um, and Robinson. Um, uh, I'm just waiting for Robinson. There he is. Okay, excellent. <laughs> so uh, unlike the first panel, a number of these panelists actually raised questions, but um, uh, I'm not going to kind of put people on the spot to answer those immediately. It was really striking to see the different future visions and some kind of reality photos, thank you, Clark, of what these things look like and on scale, you know, what this requires of us to think about land use and and what the implications that will have. And the consortium that I'm director of does some projects where we try to engage local communities in some discussion about what do you want this to look like? What opportunities do you see? What risks and concerns do you have? I wanna start the discussion in thinking about just the title of the session, Energy Innovations. So different sectors have different innovation models. And I'm kind of a newbie when it comes to energy, but you know it's striking that energy innovation does often involve public-private partnerships, and to some degree, even collaboration among what would otherwise be competing firms in setting standards and building this out. So um, thinking to the future, how do you see the innovation approach changing in the energy sector? And anyone can jump in. <laughs> I'm happy to, to take the first step, Arthur. Um, I, I think as I was saying earlier, we recognize that to achieve our climate goals, the federal investments on their own are not enough. And we have to figure out how we can catalyze these trillions of dollars of private sector capital to achieve liftoff across a range of different technology areas. And unfortunately, we don't have decades to wait to affect change. We need a more focused strategy that I think has started to evolve over the last couple of years of private sector led government enabled innovation, demonstration and deployment. And most of the projects that I touched on today, they're collaborative partnerships, as you mentioned, that use cost share agreements with the government providing up to 50% of funding in these partnerships, assisting our industry partners with those early steps to commer commercialization and deployment. Um, but I would also say there's also innovation in other areas that we need to pursue. You know, The things that keep me up at night is that we need to up our game in project management oversight. You know, we don't have time or resources to continue with projects that might be underperforming. We need to make sure that we're reviewing projects without an optimism bias. We need to make sure that we're able to no-go projects and free up funding for activities that can actually contribute to tackling the climate crisis if they are underperforming. And not just that, but it's how do we do permitting more efficiently? How can we involve impacted communities sooner so that their needs are understood and addressed earlier in the process? How can we develop the clean energy workforce now, which will be a bottleneck if we don't address it uh, until much later in the process? There's a myriad of other items that also need innovation so that these important projects can be implemented in a manner and in a time frame that will help us address the climate crisis. Clark or Robinson, do you have any thoughts on kind of the uh, the the innovation system as it's emerging? Yeah, I mean, I think Kelly's exactly right that there's a bunch of issues that mean that this is going to have to go forward in uh, in terms of of a public private partnerships if we're going to get there uh, on anything like the time scale uh, that we need to get to net zero emissions in the economy. Um, but I would also highlight uh, that what we're seeing uh, on the ground here in Arizona and all over the country uh, is that it's also the case that the public is getting much more engaged uh, and concerned about this innovation agenda. And so I think we're going to have to see this public-private partnership uh, evolve to be a tripartite partnership in which uh, 
uh, the public and citizens become an active part in addition to governments uh, and industry. Uh, we're already seeing in Arizona multiple localities where local governments are actively raising questions about how much utility scale solar uh, it's appropriate to build within their areas and where that solar should be prioritized and where not to prioritize it uh, because there's so much investment uh, happening uh, in, in this field. Uh, we're seeing, we've obviously seen lots of interest from environmental justice uh, communities uh, and energy justice communities in being part of these conversations to say it's not good enough just to build industries. We need to build industries that flow jobs into disadvantaged communities, uh, that we need to do so in ways that make sure that neighboring communities uh, are, are you know, actively part of the governance of how this development happens. So I think that piece is something also that we're seeing tremendous um, interest and commitment on the part of DOE uh, in doing. I don't see that yet on the part of the private sector partners in a lot of these big uh, big initiatives, but uh, you know, hopefully that can can evolve uh, and you know, and certainly we see the public being actively wanting to take a part in helping guide the future of this innovation. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. One of the things I, I would think we above all don't want to replicate is the sequence that happened with nuclear energy, where it went from a technological marvel to a risk from a, you know, we can do this and have a low pollution, environmentally friendly energy to, oh, my God, this is a hazard and it's being crammed down our throats and we're going to protest it. And, you know, some of the cost figures that Robinson showed you know, the nuclear one, the cost in that isn't purely the technical cost, right? It's the kind of social cost as we built more and more safety concerns around it and into it to the point where, you know, economically it, it hasn't performed well. Um, Robinson, did you have any thoughts on, you know, that big picture question about how to think about how we organize innovation in relation to this sector particularly? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I think I'm I'm glad to hear the I, I completely agree with the kind of whatever is going to happen, it's going to be a public private partnership. I think often in climate discussions or a public private partnership of some form, you know, I think often in climate and energy discussions, we like um uh the argument and the discussion can happen at this like oddly theoretical level when in fact we know that what's going to happen is the same thing that happens across you know the United States, which is it is going to be the mixed economy in some form. We have a mixed economy. We are doing a mixed economy. And what happens is going to be a mixed economy. It's just what, you know, how we govern that. And 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 as Clark said, um, you know, the political economy and, and the policies that kind of emerge and, and that we we set up to structure that. Um, I think what I'd observe is kind of um two things broadly. So I think the first is that. Uh, one commonality that's emerged, and I would say both the partisan and the bipartisan legislation that has passed during the Biden administration is a different approach to manufacturing, um, what you often hear called onshoring or this desire to concentrate more manufacturing back in the United States. And um, we see that, of course, in the IRA, which has lots of domestic or North American kind of only subsidies, subsidies you can only get access to if you, if you do the final assembly or you do some aspect of the mineral refining uh, for an EV, for instance, in the United States or in, in an allied country, essentially. Um, uh, or, I mean, for the EV credit, actually, you must build, you must do final assembly of the vehicle in, the, in, in North America. Uh, but we also see it in the CHIPS Act. We see it in aspects of the bipartisan infrastructure law. And of course, there's a, like a populist reading of that. But I, I think the other idea that's flowing into those policy decisions that is a fairly bipartisan idea at this point when lawmakers are focused enough on the question to like actually build it into how the laws work is this idea that you can't do manufacturing too far from the design or technician, you know, the technical aspects of the innovation process that manufacturing and design or manufacturing and innovation or R&D 
is like a cycle and the tools that you use in a manufacturing process and the, and, and the, the, the stuff that, you know, technicians and, and floor workers learn when they're actually making the, the products does feed back into the innovation process. And the innovation is actually something that happens between the assembly workers and the engineers and the designers. It's not just something that happens like in a, in a, in a white collar workplace, um, where only designers and, and engineers work. And that's something we've kind of abstracted away over the past 30 years in the American economy uh, for, for cost related reasons. And about 10 years ago, a researcher named Susan Berger at MIT wrote a report that said basically that it was unsustainable and for biotech, for materials, for clean energy, we were going to need to reshore some aspects of production. And I think a lot of the Biden administration policy um, is, is focused on doing that. That's a really great point. And you know, I've been talking to some people about this recently that we kind of need a, a new analysis of what um, philosophers of science for a long time called called a tacit knowledge. So that, you know, there's a set of practices, skills and know-how that are not easily codified, that do not go into textbooks and that are difficult to teach in a classroom and that have historically been taught through kind of apprenticeship and in practice. I mean, you mentioned biotech. I once knew this guy who worked at Pfizer who told me he could walk into a manufacturing plant. These were when they were making bi uh, antibiotics in the early years. Um, and he could literally, by the smell of it, tell you the yield, right? So because it's a biological organism and, and you know, the way a good uh, brewer would be able to tell you a lot about what's happening in the, in the brewing process without having to taste it. Um, and so that's going to be quite critical for us as a nation as we think about re-onshoring and building this manufacturing capacity to build up that process of teaching and conveying and building tacit knowledge. Um, I want to shift to a second question that none of you addressed particularly explicitly, and yet is kind of quite important to this whole sequence of looking to the future. And that's that, you know, you pick up the paper any given winter day, and I'll hear that the energy grid is fragile. It's about to break down. It's not ready for this future. So if electricity needs to flow in both directions, as I put solar panels on my rooftop, um, and as we build new wind, solar, and other power installations that, you know, optimally may not be located next to our current high voltage transmission lines, what is the future of the grid? And how do we overcome, you know, the inertia that's been there in terms of grid building or grid maintenance or grid updating? I can sort of take a first crack at that uh, if you'd like, um, although I'm sure Kelly has lots to say, too, because DOE has been spending lots of money on the grid. Um, you know, I, I think the um, the future of the grid is yet to be written, and that's one of the interesting uh, pieces of this uh, puzzle. Um, what's absolutely clear is that electricity growth during this period that we've been talking about from the 1970s to the present has been relatively modest in the United States. Uh, and as a consequence, that's been one of the reasons we haven't spent perhaps as much money on the grid um, as we've needed to in, in various places. Um, it's also you know, expensive and people have wanted that decline in energy prices that electricity prices that Richard talked about this earlier this morning to continue, uh, or at least to stay stable. And that's uh, slowed uh, investments as, as well. It's absolutely clear that for all kinds of reasons, we're gonna want to electrify a lot more of the economy, starting with electric vehicles, but also lots and lots of things in heavy industry. Um, and that means we're gonna need a lot more capacity for long distance transmission. We're gonna need a lot more capacity for local distribution grids. Um, we're gonna want to continue to upgrade those with respect to the data and information capacities to flow back and forth so that we can do all kinds of demand management, for example, as a way to offset uh, having to build new generation, especially uh, in times when say the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. Um, so it's just the grid is going to become a much more complicated uh, entity, as you were alluding to. It's going to have many, many more parts. Uh, it's going to take a lot more sophisticated management, and it's going to have to be a lot bigger uh, 
Um, and and so all of that is real and it's going to take substantial investment. And there's a bunch of money in the IRA and IIJA for that, for that reason. But it's also true that we don't entirely know exactly how we need to build it out, although we know some of the big pieces. So let me just give you one example, which relates to the, the question of which direction are we going. Here in Phoenix, uh, we're adopting electric vehicles just as fast as, as the fastest places in the country. Uh, and uh, we are seeing very clearly when people are charging those electric vehicles. They're charging them at midnight in their homes, uh, in well, in their garages, sorry. Um, and that's a bit of a challenge because the future of the electricity grid in Arizona and Southern California is a solar grid. Uh, already in California for six months of the year, they have negative electricity prices in the middle of the day because there's so much solar energy available. And we're going to want to dump that elect those electrons directly into car batteries if we can. But that entails a whole level of new innovation to build out a daytime charging grid rather than a nighttime charging grid. But we honestly don't know yet whether behaviorally people will be willing to do that, whether businesses will be able willing to make the investment in their parking lots for their workers and their customers to have that charging infrastructure in the daytime. So there, and this is like a multi-billion dollar question. Do we build a grid that can charge cars at night or do we build a grid that can charge cars in the day here in Phoenix, just in Phoenix? It's a multi-billion dollar question. So, you know, there are real, I think, conversations that we need to have as society not just in the industry, to figure out what kind of world do we want to live in in 2050? Um, I would add to that. Yeah, I'll just I'll just join right in. So uh, what, what I'd add to that is not only do we not build the grid from the 70s on, you know, to the 70s, let's say to 2010, to establish mm -hmm. a completely arbitrary point in time, um, but um, not only do we fail, do, do we not build out the grid during that time? Uh, or, or at least not see kind of a rapid grid expansion because electricity demand was growing so slowly or was was flat. Um, but also because the electricity system at that time ran on coal, gas, oil, um, and we could move all of those things around. And I think something that's often kind of lost in these discussions is that if you think about other fuels that we run the energy system on, coal, coal moved by railroads. We have a lot of railroads in this country. The freight railroad system is, is relatively robust. We move a lot of coal by railroads. Gas, we move a lot of gas by pipelines. Oil, we move a lot of oil by, by pipelines and, and, and train. Um, now, oil plays less of a role in the energy system, in the electricity grid than it, than it did during the 70s, uh, but um, uh, it was replaced in some part by coal. But um, uh, it wasn't until recently that we even thought we would need to move around electrons because you could just move the fuel to where the where the plants were. Um, and and only recently did we begin to confront that you know resources would be very geographic elect electricity generating resources be very geographically specific. Um, and that it would make sense, for instance, for us to like send, you know, gigawatts of power east uh, in, during the Pacific afternoon and, and the East Coast daytime, or send gigawatts of power from wind plants west during the Pacific evening and, and the East Coast overnight. Uh, that kind of long distance transmission was just not something that was necessary when you could move fuel around, or for that matter, when you could just dam a river and create a new hydro resource. Um, the other thing that I'd only add to that is that um, as we think about permitting reform and, and, and ways to permit things easily, a lot of those other forms of moving fossil fuels around already have their permitting reform. Natural gas is very easy to build a pipeline in a way that it's not to build new transmission. Um, and that's just a systematic bias built into the energy system that I think it's worth keeping in mind as we um, consider what policies might be necessary to kind of accelerate the, the energy transition and accelerate decarbonization. And I would just add quickly to what Clark said, we are spending a lot of money <laughs> to address this problem. Just yesterday, my sister office, the grid deployment office at DOE uh, announced a $10.5 billion uh, investment in grid re uh, resilience and innovation partnerships to improve resilience of the power system against the growing th threats of climate change, extreme weather, 
It is the federal government's largest single direct investment in critical grid infrastructure and will catalyze more than 8 billion in uh, public and private investment. So a lot of activity going on from the DOE perspective in terms of uh, shoring up the grid, but also a lot of investment and in demonstrations in grid scale, long duration energy storage, hydrogen, clean hydrogen as an energy storage uh, vehicle as well. So um, multifaceted. Fascinating. Great, great, great. So I'm going to take some of the questions from the uh, Q&A from our audience. Um, and thank you, audience members who have been engaging and sticking with us. There's an active chat. Um, so, you know, there's there's a very interesting set of questions here, but let me just start with one that climate, of course, is a global problem. Um, and some of the alternative energy solutions we saw in one of the earlier talks have emerged from uh, China and Denmark. Um, and so the question here is, you know, in the other direction, does U.S. government policy influence stop at the U.S. border? Can some of the things that we're doing now um, through OSED and other parts of DOE actually help shape and improve practices around the world? I would definitely say yes. And we have active and ongoing uh, partnerships and discussions with many different nations that we're learning from and they're learning from us as well. So in terms of the direct air capture technology that I referenced earlier, you know, one of those facilities is actually built, uh, is, a, is a larger scale facility of what is uh, currently being operated in Iceland. But uh, as we scale up and make it even larger, there are lessons to be learned that we can share with others. And so it really is a, uh, we learn from them and they can learn from us as well. I think I would I would add to that. I think that that idea of what can the U.S. do to help global decarbonization or what can any country do to help global decarbonization is really at the core of the technological development approach um, and deployment approach that the Biden administration has taken. And that more broadly, I think, kind of underpins this like green vortex idea, which is, you know, the U.S. is about 12 percent of global carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions. That's going to go down in the next few years, uh, in the next decades, simply uh, because um regardless of what the U.S. does, because other countries are going to develop themselves and want fossil fuels themselves. Well, and as you start looking at the rest, I think I think every climate person has this moment where they look at what projected emission sources are going to be in the 21st century. And it's not the U.S. and it's not even China. It's 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 the BRICS countries, right? It's Indonesia, it's India, it's South Africa, it's Brazil. It's countries that our middle income countries right now that are are about to see the kind of huge um, industrialization that we've seen in, in China and East Asia over the past few decades. That means that those countries can't pursue a fossil focused development path um, if we are to preserve a livable climate. And that means that you know, clean technologies and zero carbon technologies must be available and must be cost competitive for them when they begin to pursue these development paths. And that's that's the role that um, I think lowering global technology costs uh, can play. And, and that's why so much policy now focuses on lowering global technology costs, because um, that's a that's a positive. You know, if you if you bring down the cost of making a solar panel, that's a positive externality that everyone can benefit from. Great, great. So I would. Go ahead, Clark. I, yeah. I just add one quick thing, which is I think that there's a lot to be learned um, in, in two areas, and it's going to be massive mutual learning all over the planet. The first is, you know, the big difference between fuel-based uh, energy systems and electricity-based, you know, renewables-based uh, systems is that you have to pay for all the equipment up front in renewables-based systems. Um, and that just means you can't spread out the cost of your energy system as you're using the energy. Instead, you have to pay for it all up front. That's just a money and time problem. That's banks are supposed to figure out how to solve that. Uh, we're supposed to be able to, to move, move that stuff around, but we really haven't figured out how to make these ultra low levelized cost of energy options available to lots and lots of people around the world um, through mechanisms that uh, that spread that cost over the lifetime of the assets uh, rather than uh, rather than having to pay for it up front. And the other piece is, of course, you know then you then you bleed the benefits of these technologies to the lenders, for example. 
Um, and I think there's a lot of creativity happening uh, in a lot of parts of the world that we can probably learn from here um, about how to do those kinds of things uh, better uh, in, in our economy. Um, and the other thing that I will say is that we in the U.S., frankly, have a two model uh, solar deployment uh, system going, a rooftop if you own your own home or a utility scale uh, kind of alternative. And in other parts of the world, um, there are there are dozens of mixed in between uh, types of models. And if we really want to unleash solar around the world, uh, we've got to figure out how to enable these highly creative kinds of different ways of doing uh, solar even more than we are doing at the world. The, the rest of the world, I think, is figuring out how to do that much more quickly than we are. But for example, in Puerto Rico, it would be super helpful if we could unleash the pent up so social demand for different kinds of solar models to really go forward uh, down there and, and help position communities to be much more resilient uh, to future hurricanes, for example. So that kind of leads us uh, in a nice way to a next couple of questions that people have posed both in the Q&A and in the chat around um, how to think about equity and equitable transition in this sector. And so O said uh, on its mission statement talks about an equitable transition to a decarbonized energy system. And uh, a couple, you know, Clark's mentioned it, Robinson did. Um, so I'm just curious, um, maybe Kelly, start with you, but can you talk more about how to think about equity in this space and what we can do to, in fact, advance that as we move forward? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to. This is a, a subject that I'm passionate about. Uh, so right from the get-go, when we are reviewing the projects that we're going to select, we tell them up front that 20% of their overall score is going to be based on community benefits plans. And when I say that, that involves many different elements, including good paying jobs, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, community engagement, but also the Justice 40 initiative. And that initiative, if you're not familiar with it, is that 40% of the overall benefits of certain investments, federal investments, should be flowing to disadvantaged communities that are already overburdened by pollution. And so that is something that we're taking very seriously. So we have uh, selected projects, including the ones that we recently announced that um, have committed to these actions. We are also doing something that we've never done before, which is before we even put these projects under award, we're going out in person to meet with the communities where these projects will be located to find out from them what are they concerned about? What would they like to see? What are the most important benefits to them? And then taking that input and using it at the negotiation table during the agreements, uh, negotiating the agreements. So um, we really want to make sure that we are not just doing things the way that we've done it in the past. We want to make sure that the communities are front and center. I have to give uh, Kelly and DOE enormous credit for how they've approached uh, equity and justice. Uh, the proof will be in the pudding when we ultimately get hydrogen hubs that are, bit, that are built out and we see where the benefits flow. And I hope that we've got some projects that also get funded to track that over time um, and really understand what works and what doesn't work and how to do it better. Um, but uh, but the guidance that OCED put, put out on this is, was um, four times as long as the allowed page limit for these proposals, <laughs> having written two of these community benefits plans myself. Um, so they did a fantastic job uh, from the very beginning of mapping it out. And it's really important because, you know, if you look at what the International Energy Agency or Bloomberg New Energy Finance uh, says we're going to spend on a clean energy transformation worldwide, it's, you know, somewhere between 100 and $200 trillion dollars. And if all we get out of that is another energy system that kind of looks like the current energy system but doesn't emit carbon dioxide, that will be have been a huge waste of enormous human resources. We need to make those investments, investments in improving the human future and really making an inclusive and equitable human future alongside. We know the energy industry has huge impacts on the well-being of people uh, but for both good and bad. And we need to make sure that these investments are ones that really uh, uplift uh, the parts of the world that have not 
been able to have modern electricity services, for example, uh, uh, you know, the, the billion people who continue to struggle even to get electricity uh, in their daily lives. So, you know, I think this is a real opportunity for us to do it right. And I, and I am a huge fan of what DOE has been doing on this front. Uh, Robinson, do you have any? Maybe it. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a bit of a stinker on this one, or not a stinker, but I, I, let, let me let me toss in a, a, a twist. So I agree that DOE has really prioritized community benefits agreements and, and has made them central to its its how it's handling funding here. And, and I'm very interested to see how that process goes, because I, I also think that it's really unprecedented the amount of focus that there's been on um, making sure that communities will benefit. I mean, it's right there in the name, but make sure that 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 communities um, defined in various ways will benefit from having these large scale new forms of energy infrastructure in their backyards. That being said, I, I do think there's a bit of a, I think equity is a little, is, is trickier than we sometimes discuss. And that's because democratic legitimacy is very hard. Um, and generating democratic legitimacy for groups that are not governments like democratic governments, you know, that exist through our already existing democratic structure is very difficult. Uh, there are forms of, of nonprofits, of outside you know, groups that do have some forms of democratic legitimacy. There are these member-based organizations like a church um, or like a like the Boy Scouts or something, but those are on decline in America in, in a, a macro way. And that's not to say that they don't they aren't still legitimate. They they are when you can find them, but it could be hard to find institutions like that in every community. Um, and I think that I, I just, um, you know, when we talk about equity, we're usually talking about groups of people who for uh, racial and class based or, or, you know, other kind of vectors of their identity related reasons uh, or b due to the economic history in the region um, are excluded from what we would consider to be, you know, proper representation in the local government or proper representation at some form of the democratic entity. And we have ways of protecting individual rights in those scenarios. But I think producing outcomes that are going to be seen as um, ubiquitously valid, <laughs> that everyone likes, and that um, are seen as having some form of legitimacy that everyone accepts is going to be very, very hard. Uh, and, and you know, I can't think of a better way to do it necessarily than having an agreement that everyone kind of signs going in that says, here's what we're going to do. Uh, but but um, uh, to give a completely off the wall example, you know, here in DC, we have a very good public transit, you know, metro based system called, uh, you know, called the Metro or WMATA. And one thing that the head of WMATA did when they were first building it was not try to go and and I would say that WMATA for all its flaws does is is a fairly um let's let's say it permits equitable outcomes it could be designed maybe in better ways but it permits equitable outcomes but one of the things that WMATA did when it was being built was not uh kind of get everyone's buy-in it was try to build the system as quickly as possible because it knew once it built the system then good things would follow and you could keep building the system on top of that um but uh, but that as long as you didn't have the system, people might try to fight it or they might try to poison pill it in various ways. Um, now, of course, WMATA had democratic legitimacy because it was created by governments, the local governments and the federal government. But um, I, I guess I do want to kind of put a twist here that I think um, when we're going into these projects, it may seem like we're going to be able to create some community consensus about whether they're good or not. But whenever you have large scale infrastructure, large scale corporate investment in an area, I think you'd be very hard pressed to find people, to find a consensus among communities about whether that that investment is 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 good or not in every context. And I think we might see that with these forms of large scale infrastructure too. No question. And thank, thank you, Robinson. That's a very important point. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're about 10 minutes over the time we officially announced. Our <laughs> audience is still with us. And I, I do want to ask um, one more question. So I'm going to try to do the equivalent of uh, Eric's lightning round from the first one and, and ask you fundamentally, what is it individual consumers should do? So if you think back to the 1970s, we were told to save energy, put on sweaters, turn out the lights when you leave the room. That was a big thing in my childhood. In the 80s and 90s, it was go, 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 you know, buy an SUV, build big. 
Um, and interestingly, after the 2008 Great Recession, and Robinson showed this in one of his graphs, we actually had a flatlining of energy consumption per household. And my hypothesis is probably it's just, you know, people began to switch over to LED lights and they kind of, uh, every appliance I buy is less and less energy each time, right? A new television compared to the big heavy cathode ray tube is, is using just a fraction of the energy. Um, but we're kind of hitting the limit of what I can do just in buying things to shift it. So what's next? Uh, what can I, as an individual, what should I be doing? Um, how do I help with all this? I'm happy to start. Um, I would really like consumers to ask themselves some basic questions, which they probably don't think through on a daily basis. So if you're taking the bus to work every day, the public bus, how is that bus fueled? Is it electric? Is it hydrogen fuel cell? When they have packages arrive at their doorstep, did those packages get most of the way to their house through clean powered ships, through heavy duty trucks with clean energy? And if they don't like the answers to those questions, they should let their voices be heard. Um, and also if there's an opportunity for them to participate in a virtual power plant, distributed energy uh, system demonstration, I also think that that's something that they should seriously consider. So to me, it goes a lot a lot further be beyond just the, the light bulbs. <laughs> Robinson Clark, do you have any quick observations? Well, I think, you know, asking hard questions is is... Uh, right. And the first people they're going to have to ask hard questions of are the people who are selling them large ticket appliances. Automobile dealers are struggling to figure out how to sell electric vehicles because that doesn't really fit their business model. Um, I couldn't get a non-gas water heater installed in my house when I had a broken water heater because it's going to take a longer conversation with the people who actually do that work to get this uh, done. And, and so it's going to take uh, uh, some hard conversations to say, no, I want something different than you're offering at the moment. Can you put the options in front of me uh, that I do actually uh, have? But then, you know, I think it is also about making the decisions when you replace these big assets. We're talking about a fairly substantial transformation of the personal environment. It's going to be a different kind of car. We're going to have different kinds of, of big appliances in our homes by the end of this. Uh, and even for those of us that are relatively wealthy, it's going to be an expensive and big transition, but it's going to be over 30 years. So, you know, it's doable, but it's not going to be uh, simple and straightforward um, uh, to get all of that uh, done. And, and it is going to take, I think, as Kelly suggests, learning some things about how we live with, with energy that are, that are different. Um, and, and it is going to also take asking those questions more broadly uh, of our bigger institutions uh, that provide us with energy as well about, you know, what are they doing and, and, and how, are, how are they doing it and who's benefiting from what they're doing. Robinson? Yeah, let's see. I, I don't think I can do this in 10 seconds, but let's see if I can do it in 60 seconds. Um, so the first thing is I would say that the question's right on and that I do think choice matters again. You know, I think during the 20 teens, we used to say that it's not about the choices you make, it's about systematic changes in the that need to happen in policy. And while that is true, a lot of systematic changes have happened in policy. And now that we've created price parity in many cases between the clean option or, or will soon create price parity between the clean option and the, the fossil fueled option, we actually do need people to choose the clean option, uh, especially if you care about climate change as an issue, you actually, you actually do need to choose it. And so I think to, to kind of counter back on what we used to say during the 20 teens, choice does matter. And I think we're wise to think about it. That being said, I think there's two different ways to think about choice. I think the first is about what you can do to reduce, you know, the classic things you can do to reduce your own carbon footprint. Um, uh, you know, should you be e-biking places instead of driving? These are questions that are really well traveled online. And I think people can find a lot of resources about them. Where I think what I really like what Clark said and where I would lean personally myself and encourage people to think about is your own participation in systems and in markets and how you can change where you spend your money in systems and markets, not necessarily with an eye 
toward reducing your emissions most at the personal level, but how you can shift as a consumer the markets that you participate in so that they bring the entire market with them toward a low carbon equilibrium. And so the example there is like, yes, if you if you're thinking about buying an EV, yes, go on out, buy an EV and you can find lots of articles online about how you should ride your e-bike everywhere instead of an EV. And do you know what? On a day-to-day -day basis, yes, you should be trying to ride your e-bike. However, uh, we actually do need people to adopt EVs and, and the less money that you put into the fossil fuel system, you know, economy, and that you put into the new clean economy instead, the better. And that's the point of having an EV. It's not only so that you reduce your own carbon footprint on your transportation, it's that you shift money from the fossil fuel economy to the new, new clean economy. And that goes for other appliances, that goes for where you live, goes for a lot of things. Last thing I'd say, and I think it's a through line from this panel and the last panel, is that local and state policy is incredibly important. It's also incredibly wonky. Um, and I think we need people who are going to be ruthless uh, citizens at the local and state level focused on decarbonization, um, you know, above almost all other outcomes. And I, I think there's a lot of leverage still there for people to pay attention to these systems. But, you know, if you're if you're one of the 45 participants remaining on this call, I would I would note that you've been here through a very wonky three-hour Zoom discussion of this, and there are many, many more happening in your area that have much more influence on local policy. And I would really encourage, whether it's your PUC or your town council, they are all making decisions that are going to affect the energy system. And, and um, I think that's where there's the most leverage for a highly engaged, highly informed uh, Americans to participate right now. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. So I have a couple of closing remarks um, to give, but uh, really thank you all. So first, um, I really want to thank the co-organizers of today's program. So the Smithsonian Lemelson Center, um, especially Eric Hintz, who worked with myself, as well as uh, two colleagues from Johns Hopkins University, Jeremy Green and Yulia Frommer, who were kind of in the background today, but really were key in helping to organize and plan it. So uh, it was a wonderful collaboration. And I think, you know, we started out thinking, how can we run a workshop that is really uh, on, a, on a wonky topic, as Robinson points, that is accessible and communicates to a general public. And I really feel like you guys succeeded at that today. So I want to thank all the speakers for that. And this will live on online on YouTube. Um, and I want to also give special thanks to the Lemelson Center's Emma Grand for managing the webinar and Laura Havel for building a website and marketing the event. Um, as you see, we have several upcoming events we're inviting everyone to attend. And in closing, let me really give a round of thanks and applause to Robinson Meyer, Kelly Cummins, and Clark Miller. Thank you so much um, and have a great afternoon and evening. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Arthur. Thank you so much. Thank you.